What's up, guys? Welcome to the AwesomeWorld.com NBA Deeper Dive presented by Prize Picks. Got a 10 game NBA slate to break down, so we got plenty of options tonight. Should be a good one. I'm Alex Baker, joined today by Adam. Should my money share? You see him on the Deeper Dive every night. Adam, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. It's been a really long time since we've done a show together. I don't actually remember when the last time was, but I want to say it was probably like last basketball season, I guess. So uh, nice, nice change of pace. Yeah, I don't usually get the call up for, for these uh, these shows, so I'm excited to be able to talk some hoops with you here. So, um, I mean, let's start with last night just a little bit. It was kind of an interesting slate because right the hour before lock, we got LeBron James ruled out. How, how did you handle that? I handled it poorly. Uh, so I said going into the night, like before we got that news, I said that I liked um, projecting him out because I thought you could give yourself a really good – uh, edge you know if you played a lot of those guys at low ownership and he sat then the news came out so ownership obviously increased uh, I don't think I bumped those guys quite enough like I obviously I, I made them look like good plays but I didn't get nearly enough Westbrook or Davis so um, didn't didn't go really well well the overtime probably didn't help out too much then no. but uh, it was a good example of how in NBA DFS the longer you wait to build your lineups the more of an advantage you can get because I mean, I didn't think those guys were mandatory, but having some action from the Lakers last night with Noah Braun seemed like a pretty good idea. Of course, uh, over time, uh, it kind of sealed the deal. Tonight, we got a similar situation with Anthony Davis questionable. We'll get to that when we get to the Lakers today. But before we get going here, if you guys could uh, give us a like, a thumbs up, so that uh, – you know, we get that positive feedback. Me and Adam need to be giving you our best picks. And if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, make sure to subscribe. We got content for almost every DFS sport. So a lot of helpful information. Let's start with this um, Charlotte at Orlando game. Charlotte, uh, definitely an up and coming team with LaMelo Ball. And uh, Orlando is one of the weaker teams in the league. So pretty good matchup for Charlotte. Let's start with Lamelo. He's been having some minutes woes. Some say it's foul trouble, including Lamelo himself. I saw one of the DFS guys, Winky Christ, was posting. Uh, he like asked Lamelo in Discord what, why he wasn't playing more minutes. He's like foul trouble, bro. What do you make of Lamelo? Uh, I don't know if I totally buy that. I mean, he did have foul issues against Boston in their last game in the, the second quarter. I uh, ended up playing like 28 minutes or, tw- or about 30 minutes in regulation, but uh, the rotations haven't really been that, <clears throat> that uh, good for him anyway, from a, a minute standpoint, like you go back and look at um, the Brooklyn game. He didn't play in the fourth quarter of that game. Uh, Charlotte was the, the second unit got hot, but he had played, you know, 26 minutes through three quarters. Uh, he had played about, 10, 12, I guess he, he played like eight, 17, 18 minutes in the first half. So, uh, you know, yeah, maybe there, there are more minutes there for him. It makes sense logically. Like it would just be weird if LaMelo only plays 30 minutes a night all season long. Uh, he has a good backup in Ish Smith. So that's something that typically I don't, you know, it doesn't make me feel great about somebody's minutes, but uh, they can play alongside each other as well. And it would just be really weird if, if LaMelo is not playing more minutes uh, at some point. So um, I'm not, confident you know going like 35 36 minutes but i think that uh, he can get north of 30. definitely that's where i'm at his uh usage is up this year the assist rate is up as well so the price tag is up too i, I don't know if he's going to be a huge priority on today's slate what do you think yeah it's more of a tournament play for me uh i think the ownership makes sense where it's at uh he's he's a good option i think um but i wouldn't call him a priority for me with Scary Terry, Rozier, uh, uh, doubtful today, that opens up some minutes. We saw Kelly Oubre get the start the last two games, and he played huge minutes. So he's looking like a value piece. And then we also have P.J. Washington out, which opens up some front court re- uh, minutes. Mason Plumley is their starting center. So what else are you seeing on the Hornets team here? Yeah, I think it's pretty much the whole starting unit, I think, <clears throat> makes – at least looks like decent plays. Uh, Kelly Oubre has been playing huge minutes, getting his starts in place of, of Terry Rozier. Uh, he's around the 20 to 21% usage guy, but at 5,700, I think there's some upside there. Uh, Gordon Hayward, reasonably priced. Um, not, you know, not, not as good a fantasy producer, obviously, somebody like LaMelo, but 
typically going to play 34, 35 minutes in competitive games. Uh, Mason Plumley is someone that I expect to play more with PJ Washington sideline. We saw that last game. He played about 31 or 32 minutes in regulation. Um, I expect more of the same here. He's about a one point. He's greater than a one fantasy point per minute guy over the last couple of seasons. So I think that, uh, there's some merit in looking at him as well, but none of these guys at their prices really stand out as, as priorities for me. I'd say Lamelo is the, the top option followed by Hayward uh, and then Uber, a Plumlee and Bridges are kind of in a, you know, a separate tier for me. Yeah. No one's super cheap on the team, but all of them look a little bit underpriced uh, today on, on DraftKings. Um, yeah. Mason Plumlee, I feel like could get a big minutes bump because the backup situation is pretty much some some rooks. So Nick Richards, I guess maybe he played last year, but not much, is the backup center. Anyway, let's go to Orlando. They uh, have Gary Harris back, uh, but they're starting Franz Wagner, Wendell Carter, and Mo Bamba. It's got to be one of the biggest, like, three forward sets in the league. Like, um, what do you make of this Magic team? It's pretty messy because they just have so many guys that they're going to give minutes to. They ran an 11-man rotation last time. I'm expecting that to be the case going forward. You know, at some point, maybe Robin Lopez loses some minutes or Brustakis comes out of the rotation. But uh, you just have so many sort of interchangeable pieces here. So it makes them difficult to trust. And on top of that, they're just a bad team that is, you know, going to have some really inefficient games. They're going to be blown out a lot. But I do think there's some decent pricing here. Uh, Jalen Suggs at 5k on DraftKings, I think is kind of interesting. He has a 27% usage rate so far this season. Uh, That may come down a little bit, but there's not really, you know, high usage guys on this Orlando team to take shots away from him. He's clearly someone that you would think Orlando wants to develop his offensive game and to be taking shots. So um, I think at 5k, there is some upside there on, on Jalen Suggs. There's certainly upside for Mo Bamba, who's playing 30 to 32 minutes in competitive games. Typically Uh, he's, you know, a high upside guy. Cole Anthony is playing well this year. He's rebounding at a really, really good rate so far. Uh, gets a lot of assists. He's like he's relatively likely to lead the team in minutes played as well. Uh, so I think all three of those guys look like solid options. You know, again, not guys that I expect to uh, be jamming into every lineup or anything like that, but I do like the pricing on those three. Yeah, it's a good call with uh, Cole Anthony rebounds. So it looks like he's had a 20% defensive rebounding percentage, which is very high for a point guard. He looks like a nice value. Uh, one thing I want to get your opinion on is I'm kind of wondering if Gary Harris eventually joins the starting lineup in place of Wagner and then the front court players all get less minutes. I don't know. What do you think? It wouldn't surprise me. The thing with like a team with Orlando, though, it's so difficult because it's not like they're trying to win games. You know, they don't they don't care. Um, they would much rather, you know, develop basically the guys that they have starting right now. So it wouldn't be surprising if as he you know, gets his legs back under him, you get Gary Harris stepping into a starting role where he plays like 26 to 28 minutes uh, and Wagner goes back to the bench. But I don't think it'll have too much of an impact on playing time. You know, like if Wagner eventually does come off the bench, you probably stop projecting him for like 32 or 33 minutes and cut it back a bit. But Harris played uh, 20, 20 to 22 minutes last game. I think that, you know, I think he's more likely as if they do ramp up Harris's minutes, I think first he starts taking minutes from Bustakis before he starts taking minutes from Franz Wagner. Nice. So that's uh, encouraging that maybe we can get some value there. Now, Jalen Suggs is uh, a pretty promising rookie. Uh, he's not cheaper on, on DraftKings, but on FanDuel, uh, they have the same price, but you have more money on FanDuel to spend. So any love for Jalen Suggs? Yeah, I think in tournaments, he looks good. I mean, 27% usage rate so far this year. He has a 42% true shooting percentage, which is absolutely terrible. Uh, And he's still averaged 0.82 DraftKings points per minute so far. So it's one of those spots where I look at it and I just think that there's a much higher ceiling than he's probably getting credit for right now because, uh, you know, we don't, we obviously don't have like a previous NBA rate that we can look at and say, you know, and easily say, you know, oh, Suggs is shooting 10% below his career average or anything like that. But 42% is insanely bad. And there's kind of nowhere for him to go but up. And it's not like he's been bad from a fantasy standpoint anyway. 0.82 DraftKings points per minute is is okay, especially if you're going to play around 30 minutes at 5K. So um, I think that there's a, a probably a higher ceiling on him than he's getting credit for. It kind of reminds me of Jalen Green um, on Houston, where, you know, it kind of, he had that one massive game that kind of seemingly came out of nowhere compared to his previous games, but it's just a matter of, you know, Suggs is going to get opportunities. He just needs to shot the ball. Definitely. We'll have to see how he, how he does. Uh, 
All right. On um, this next game, Washington and, and Boston, I'd say this is a tough match for Washington and for Boston, a pretty good one. So start with the Washington side. Now, Spencer Dinwiddie uh, seems to be fully back from injury, but his minutes haven't really lived up to my expectations. He's, um, I mean, I was expecting like him to average 30 or more, but it doesn't seem to be quite that high. And then the production hasn't really been amazing either, except on a per minutes basis. So what are you making with Dinwiddie? Yeah, I mean, I think by the end of the season, he probably is averaging, you know, like 33, 34 minutes per game. But it kind of has seemed like Washington's trying to limit him somewhat, still coming back from that um, ACL tear. I, I thought that it was a good sign that in the overtime game the other day, he got up to uh, mid-30s in minutes. Not that, you know, you're going to start projecting that to happen, but at least he physically could do it. I think that's a good sign. Uh, so for now, I think that assuming he plays 30 minutes is pretty safe. Like there's going to be some games where he plays a few minutes more, but – I think that, you know, as the season goes on, you start to see more playing time from him. It's just tough to get to that DraftKings price at 7,100. Uh, you know, in 30 minutes, that doesn't look very appealing. Even if you were to extend it to 32 or 33, I would have a pretty tough time getting there uh, with Bradley Beal healthy. I mean, Dinwiddie's still going to be the second highest usage guy on this team, you would expect. But Beal dominates usage so much. Beal also is involved as a playmaker. So uh, Dinwiddie, you know, averaging one to 1.1 fantasy points per minute, I think is, is pretty likely. But at 7,100 on a slate this big, it's pretty tough for me to get there. Agreed, yeah. He doesn't really stand out uh, as a good value play today. But um, a couple of guys that are, are cheap are, well, somewhat cheap, Harrell and Gafford. They're splitting 48 minutes at center, and they're productive per minute, but like it seems to like the pendulum has been tipping a little bit towards Harrell. And he, they're both playing about the same amount of minutes. So that makes it tough. Do you see any, anything there? Not too much. Like they're, they're I think it's pretty much just going to be the case for the entire, or at least until Thomas Bryant comes back, that neither one's going to look very good in terms of median projections. Um, because you kind of can't assume that they're going to play more than like 24, 25 minutes each but there is upside for them in tournaments because there's a lot of volatility in their playing time like there's gonna be some games where Harold closes and plays 28 minutes there's gonna be other games where Gafford plays well and gets the bulk of the minutes but uh, on this slate I have a hard time getting to either one uh, one concern that I do have with Gafford and I mentioned it this morning with Josh is that I wouldn't be surprised if you just don't see him be the same level of fantasy player this year that he was last year playing with Westbrook. That was just an absolutely perfect fit for Gafford, uh, you know, as a rim runner and, and Westbrook basically just topping, tossing him lobs on the break. Uh, I think that he could see a, you know, downtick in production this year anyway. Yeah, definitely. Playing with Westbrook, they get a lot more easy buckets and Dinwiddie for sure. Now on the Boston side, uh, Al Horford is probable. He missed a, a few games. Um, I'm not seeing a ton on the Boston side, but one guy that I'm always intrigued by is Robert Williams. He's been getting a lot more minutes this year, but he's p prone to foul trouble, so it's hard to know if that'll be the case indefinitely. What do you make of Williams? I'm a little concerned by his production so far this year, particularly um, alongside Horford. They've only played 40 minutes together going back to the preseason, but Williams has just been like completely non-existent over that stretch. A 4.4% uh, usage rate when Horford's been on the floor with him. His rebounding percentage is down to 10.4%. So I think that there's a decent chance that Horford just takes production away from him and you do see Williams uh, you know, be less productive on a per minute basis than he was last year. I still think he has a massive ceiling. I do still like the minutes. I think it's likely that you get around 30 minutes from him. Um, his, you know, average playing time this year has been skewed by a couple of, of overtime games, but um, I think he probably ends up averaging 28 to 30 minutes. He gives you a really high ceiling because of uh, the block and steal upside, but I'm just concerned by the the lack of rebounding this year. Uh, he's got a 13 and a half percent rebounding percentage overall. That's down from about 20% last year. Usage rates down from about 16 and a half percent to 10%. Um, so I, I do think that he's a good play, but I, I actually think he's going a little bit over on here. Yeah. Now that I'm looking into it, like just, uh, I think he might, you, you're right. His production has been a lot worse this year so far. So it does make uh -huh. sense to, I think the foul trouble is a real problem too. And in addition, Horford uh, coming back means Grant Williams is probably going to go to the bench, and that's a guy that could potentially get those center minutes. So a little bit less uh, exciting. I'm glad that uh, 
you at least somewhat buy into my Robert Williams take because Josh has been DMing me that I'm an idiot for the last like 30 minutes about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't see a ton here from a fantasy standpoint. What do you, what do you think? Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's another team where I think there's a lot of tournament upside. Like it's, it's a Washington team that's likely to be more defensively this year. You have a really high ceiling from guys like Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Um, and I also am interested in Horford. He's seemed, you know, obviously very limited sample this year, but uh, he has seemed, like he can still play. Uh, he played about 30 minutes last game. He closed actually over Williams the last game he played. Um, he's getting run with the second unit, which is nice. I think at 5,800, um, especially with him not projected for much ownership right now, only 8% on DraftKings. I like going there uh, actually more so than I like going to Williams at, at his ownership. Nice. All right. Um, Miami and Brooklyn, uh, everyone has kind of uh, been seeing Kevin Durant perform at a really high level and uh, I know last year he was kind of coming back from this injury so that begs the question is he going to be at a new level this year or has he also been running hot what do you think uh for Durant I mean yeah I expect him to be really good uh 63.3 percent true shooting percentage so far this year um he he should be the number one guy you know most of the time like you've seen in the past when Kyrie doesn't play um, Harden's assist numbers go up a crazy amount, but Durant is when he's on the floor, he should be the number one option out there, uh, especially now that it seems like Harden may be still playing through a, um, some, some sort of injury. So I lean towards Durant being the guy for Brooklyn. Harden still gives you a very high ceiling and certainly he's going to have games where he just takes over. But uh, I, I view Durant as the number one here. Is he the number one? to the tune of 10.5K at DraftKings at 11K on FanDuel. That seems like maybe one of his higher prices ever. Yeah, I think it's a pretty tough price, uh, especially on this slate, because you have Giannis, who I think is in a great spot and is a better fantasy option than Durant. But you also have potentially Anthony Davis without LeBron, um, or you have Westbrook without LeBron and without Davis, you know, for $1,200 less or, or something like that on DraftKings, and he's 8400 on FanDuel. Um, so I, I think that Durant's a good play just in, you know, looking at Kevin Durant, but also it is a tough matchup against Miami. This is a team that's always uh, solid defensively. He's really expensive, and I don't think he compares favorably to somebody like Giannis, who is not much more expensive at all. Yeah, I agree. Giannis, uh, with some of the Bucks out, makes uh, him in a smash spot. All right, we got a super chat from D. Owens, 89. So thanks, D. Owens. It says Collins slash Allen or Jackson as a pivot in a Horford lineup. So I think he means John Collins, uh, Jared Allen, and uh, Jaron Jackson, maybe. It's a little bit tough to dump, but uh, which one of those guys is your favorite? Um, I would lean toward Jackson, assuming that we're talking about Jaron. Uh, he just gives you a really high ceiling. Um, Collins, I think, kind of interesting, too, because he's someone that has dealt with foul trouble this year. And so you haven't really seen exactly what it looks like when they're in a competitive game and he's not in foul trouble. So, you know, maybe some sneaky upside there. But I think Jaron Jackson would be the one I, I go to first. Yeah, I agree. I think Jackson, uh, he's coming off a game where he didn't play as many minutes, uh, but I think that could easily flip today. So I think he's a, a good GPP option. All right, for uh, the rest of Brooklyn, I mean, besides Harden, uh, who, I mean, I think he's in a decent spot, but not blowing anyone away for 10K. Um I th they, it seems like their bigs are really playing limited minutes between Griffin, Millsap, Claxton, and Aldridge. And then the guards, Patty Mills, has been just like on fire seemingly. But I don't see anyone else that's really playable. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the rotation for Brooklyn's just been an absolute nightmare. One thing to uh, keep an eye on, pay attention to, is what the starting lineup looks like. We got Bruce Brown starting in place of Nick Claxton last game. That was with LaMarcus Aldridge resting. My guess is that Claxton rejoins the starting lineup um, and that Aldridge is his backup like we had seen in every other game this year. But if Bruce Brown starts, he is only 3,700. There's not a ton of great cheap value tonight, so I wouldn't mind uh, you know throwing some darts at Brown if he's in the starting lineup. If he's not in the starting lineup, I don't see much of anything. You know, Claxton, it would still be tough to get to because uh, he's going to play like 18 to 20 minutes and Aldridge is going to play like 20 minutes and Griffin's going to play like you know 20 or 22 minutes or something. It's just it, – it's a really, really messy – rotation right now for Brooklyn. Agreed. Uh, yeah, I think there's 
Malik Monk is really cheap today, so he's kind of like that go-to value piece. Beyond him, you're right, we're kind of fed, uh, digging through scraps here, so we got to consider everyone. Now, on the Miami side, um, we had Kyle Lowry come back last game, and he played pretty high minutes, so that kind of mitigated some interest I have in, in guys like Butler and Tyler Hero. And the matchup versus Brooklyn, I guess they're defensively not not that great, so we could consider some guys. But it's a, a team in the Heat that might be easier to target when someone's out. Is there anyone you're, you're thinking about tonight? Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to be easier to target when someone's out. But I do still have interest in Butler and Bam, especially because they're not that popular here. Um, Butler's taken on an even bigger uh, usage role this year. And it's not like you know he's a low usage guy before going back to last year he's about a 26 and a half percent usage guy i don't really expect kyle lowry to get in the way of of butler i think he's just you know going to be the third piece offensively here uh so I, I have some interest in butler but more so i'm interested in bam uh 7900 for him assuming he's going to play around 32 or 33 minutes if this game's competitive uh, i think it's a spot where he can get some rebounds uh brooklyn's front court just isn't something that really concerns me. And I think that, you know, Bam just does so many things well when he's on the floor that he looks like a pretty good low owned tournament option to me with a, a high ceiling. Yeah. He always uh, has a pretty high ceiling because he can do it all. So definitely an intriguing option. 10 game slate. We really got uh, to find some standout options. So I don't know if I'm going to have a ton, but worth sprinkling in. All right. Before we get to this next game, uh, obviously we got a lot of stuff on the Osmo.com site, in addition to all this YouTube content. So for NBA, I mean, it's all the tools that you need to be a pro. The projections, ownership projections, you got our premium Slack channel, the lineup builder, uh, and then the FC add-on. And you can use the promo code NBA Deeper Dive for 25% off your first week of Platinum. Uh, and then for NBA, just uh, by itself, it's sixteen ninety five a week or four ninety five for our Express Pass, which has uh, rankings and everything for Showdown. So make sure to check out our site and our, our package because I think it, it really will help you up your game. A lot of tools that, in your arsenal that that are behind that paywall. All right, next game we got Atlanta at New Orleans. Atlanta's a five and a half point favorite. Now, New Orleans defensively has been one of the weaker teams for a while. So that must uh, that makes me think that Atlanta gets a decent bump, but uh, the sites these days pretty much incorporate that into the pricing. So the injury situation is DeAndre Hunter is back. So that is going to reduce minutes for guys like Cam Reddish, Kevin Herter, and Bogdan Bogdanovich. So I'm not really seeing a ton here. I mean, Trey Young is always a stud with huge upside. Capella and Collins, probably the other guys I'd, I'd look at. What are you seeing? Yeah, it's pretty much the same for me. I have a really hard time getting to any of the like peripheral guys here. Trey Young is pretty much always going to be a good play. 9K is a very reasonable price tag. The thing that keeps them from being a priority, though, is just that there's so many other guys around there, too, on this slate. Uh, not even, you know, mentioning those Lakers guys, but you have Lillard, you have Beal, you have uh, Jason Tatum, just, you know, three guys off the top of my head that are basically the same price. Uh, you have LaMelo that we talked about for 900 less. So it's just, you know, Young doesn't really stand out. He's a good, he's, he's definitely a good option, though. Um, Capella is interesting to me, especially in tournaments. If you're going with, like, a little bit less of a stars and scrubs build because of the lack of value that we have right now. Capella is one of those guys that he at least has the ability to go get like 50 plus fantasy points at a mid range price tag. Uh, you're assuming he's going to play like 28, 29 minutes here. He's well over a fantasy point per minute guy. It's not a bad matchup against new Orleans. Uh, so I, I like the tournament upside for Capella, but you know, again, not a priority given the fact that it's hard to project him for more than 28 or 29 minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of on Capella too. What I'm uh, seeing here, he had a minutes limit to start the year. And he's not been ramped up very fast, but it looks like he could cross 30 minutes on a good night. So uh, his price tag has come down to 7.2K or six, on FanDuel and 6.5K on, on drafting. So I think the value is there. If we're projecting, he's going to get more minutes than he has been. I mean, this is the guy that got a triple-double in blocks, if I remember right. So, I mean, that that was one of the wilder nights in NBA DFS. I don't know if that will happen, but New Orleans seems like a team that could get blocked a decent amount. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, if you think about the matchup here too, like New Orleans has a high usage 
center that scores a lot. Uh, so, you know, that you, you could make the case that, you know, maybe this is the type of game where Capella gets those minutes ramped up to try and stay on the floor with Jovell. Definitely. Yeah. If they like that matchup, uh, Jovell has been playing ridiculous minutes. So the, that's, uh, is there anyone else on Atlanta besides Trey Young and Capella that you're looking at? I think you mentioned John Collins is kind of an option. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's kind of there just in the sense where he's 6,300 and he's a good basketball player, but uh, I think Young and Capella are the two that, that really just, they're in kind of a separate tier than anyone else on Atlanta for me. Definitely. Uh, for New Orleans, uh, Zion continues to be out. Josh Hart is doubtful. So that's pretty much what we've been seeing. Their point guard this year is Devontae Graham. So he's in a spot where he no longer has to compete with Lamelo Ball for, for minutes or assists. So I think that we might see him kind of up his fantasy game. Uh, of course, Brandon Ingram is the, the main facilitator here. But uh, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, another guy that's been getting big minutes so far. He's one of our fantasy faves from last year whenever he would start. So now we get a full season, hopefully. How are you breaking down this Pelicans team? Yeah, there's a few guys here that I think I'm likely to be higher than the field on that I just think I like a little bit more. Uh, Joe Val, Ingram, Graham, all three of those guys I think look good. Uh, Valanchunas, you know, the, the price tag's rising. He's up to 8,200 on DraftKings. I think he was 7,500 on FanDuel. But I'm pretty comfortable with that given the minutes that he's playing. You know, you mentioned he's playing huge minutes this year. He's averaging about 34 minutes per game. But they've also been in a couple of blowouts. Uh the only game, I think it was the only game that was competitive where he wasn't in foul trouble or anything. He played 39 minutes the other night against Minnesota. But even at, in, in some of those blowout games, like he was playing 33 to 34 minutes and then losing like five minutes to garbage time. So I don't think you can you know, go in and say, oh, yeah, I think Valanciunas is going to play 40 minutes tonight. But I think it's very, very reasonable to expect 35 you know, minutes, give or, give or take on, on average. He's just being utilized completely differently than he ever has in his career. You know, Toronto always limited his minutes. Memphis, it was pretty tough to get him above 30 minutes there as well. Uh, New Orleans doesn't seem to have any concerns with that. He's just been playing massive minutes every night, and he's always been a very productive fantasy option. Leads the uh, entire NBA in rebound chances per game by one and a half rebound chances as well. So uh, just in, I think, still a, a very good spot for him. And then you get Ingram and Graham, who uh, Ingram's priced up a bit, but he's still a very high usage guy without Zion Williamson. Usage rate should be around 30% for him. Um, and then Devontae Graham uh, playing big minutes, played 38 minutes last game. I think that it's likely you get, you know, around 34, 35 minutes on average from him, only 5,700. So kind of surprised that ownership isn't higher on these guys right now, but I'll take it. I, I like the way they look. Definitely. Now, Valanciunas, like, I feel like I never like to project centers for more than, like, 33-ish minutes because they get in foul trouble. But, man, the minutes he's been playing have been, like, insane. Like, based on what I'm seeing, he could have a ceiling of, of about, like, 38 minutes in a, a competitive game. So that that's pretty crazy. Um, how would you prioritize the guys in the Pelicans? I think Graham, because he's the cheapest, like I think that's a really favorable price point for him. Uh, Joe Val, because he's insanely productive and playing huge minutes. Ingram, I would say, is third, but still a, a solid option. He's just a little bit more expensive than Joe Val. Um, and then I, I'm not as high on Alexander Walker, particularly on DraftKings at 6,900. It's just not really a price point that I want to get to. Uh, and then Herbert Jones, he's playing minutes and he's close to minimum salary, but he does literally nothing but play defense when he's on the floor. So um, th those two, Alexander Walker and, and Jones, are a bit behind the other three for me. Yeah, that leads me to my next question. Who is Herbert Jones? I want to say he went to, like, Alabama. I don't know. I remember rostering him in college basketball DFS. <laughs> I recognize the name. <laughs> nice, man. Uh, yeah, he's been getting pretty good minutes. He's probably the cheapest starter today. So uh, not someone I'd go to, but. That's uh, if you really need someone at 3,300, not insane. All right, next game we got Indiana at Toronto. Um, okay, so Indiana, they have Karis Levert potentially returning tonight. He uh, had that surgery last year that kept him out for most of the season. I don't expect him to be, you know, playing 30 minutes from the get go, but. This should impact the rotation a decent amount because presumably he would start. So what are you what are you gonna think happens here? Yeah, I mean, so for now, until until we get news, I'm assuming that he's not back yet today. But if he does come back and especially if he starts, it does take 
you, it, it just lowers the projection for everybody else because uh, Levert, not that he's going to take, not not that he's going like to lead the team in usage or anything, but it does just take the ball at least somewhat out of the hands of guys like Sabonis and Brogdon. I assume it would take some minutes away from, uh, or potentially take some minutes away from Duarte. First, I assume it would take minutes away from Justin Holiday. But um, yeah, if he comes back, I think it just sort of lowers the projection for, for everybody on Indiana. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, where if uh, I'm not sure exactly who starts, but I think Duarte probably continues to start and Holiday goes to the bench. So that just means Duarte could get outplayed by Holiday and lose minutes. Uh, the margin of error isn't very high on this team because the pricing isn't extremely favorable. So um, I don't really see much here. <laughs> One guy that is kind of popping up a little bit is Miles Turner. He had a like completely crazy breakout game, and then he's been in massive foul trouble the last two games, it looks like. So <laughs> uh, that isn't the worst thing for GPPs to have someone that fluctuates a ton. How are you handling Miles Turner? Yeah, I like the Turner call and kind of just the way like I think about it is like he was chalk last game at, at the same price point, you know, in cash, you know, a lot of top players were playing him and then he played 14 minutes, partly foul trouble, partly just basically was benched. Goga got in the rotation, Brissett got some extra minutes, but you would, you know, that, that game is just kind of an anomaly. I think you can just throw it away. Like it's not like Miles Turner is an unknown commodity. This is, you know, he, he's been around the while. You kind of know how Indiana uh is most is likely to use him. So if he's able to stay out of foul trouble and doesn't play particularly poorly, he's likely to give you 27, 28 minutes. He's a strong fantasy producer. So I like going back to him. And then also um, one of the more, probably the most interesting stat that I found today, just kind of digging through stuff um, in the past, the Monta Sabonis and Malcolm Brogdon have almost identical assist percentages. Um, but so far this year, Malcolm Brogdon's averaging 17 and a half potential assists per game. Sabonis is averaging six. And the reason that I think that's really noteworthy is that they do have a new coach in Indiana in Rick Carlisle. So, you know, it is possibly by design, you know, so, I, uh, you know, th- like that gap probably closes as the sample gets bigger. But I also think it's, it's you know, worth noting that Brogdon's doing a lot more playmaking at the expense of Sabonis right now. Uh, it makes it not to say Sabonis is a, a bad play, but it makes me even less likely to get to him at 9,900. And it does make me like Brogdon a bit more at 8,300 because both of these guys are playing huge minutes. But if Brogdon's just going to produce more fantasy stats now uh, under Carlisle, that's, I think, something to pay attention to. Yeah, that's a, a good thing to watch out for because what I've been seeing is they're pricing guys based on their performance last year. So Sabonis almost 10K. That's probably going to be a fade until we have some reason to believe that he's going to turn that that around because you're right, the assists are down and the usage is down. Like, not as much, but usually if uh, those two are correlated, so if, like, the assist percentage is higher, the usage will go down, like, uh, in a short sample. So there's not really any reason to believe it's a fluke. Now, on the other side of this one with Toronto, Pascal Siakam remains out, so... We've been seeing uh, Scotty Barnes play a ton of minutes, one of the better rookies so far. Kind of pricey on DraftKings at 6K, but on FanDuel at 5,300, it looks like maybe one of the better values. What are, you, what are you seeing with Barnes? Yeah, I agree with that. Like, I think on FanDuel, he stands out as one of the top options. On DraftKings, I think he's a good play as well, but the price tag isn't quite as favorable. Uh, one thing I really like about Barnes is that he is very, very heavily involved in in um, terms of peripherals. He's one of the leading rebounders on the team. Uh, he's second in potential assists. Granted, there's a huge gap between him and Fred Van Vliet, but he's doing a lot as far as you know rebounding and and assists go. Um, and then he's got about a 22% usage rate. So he's not a scoring dependent player. And when you have someone like him that in competitive games he's likely to play 35, 36 minutes. Uh, it's just hard for him to fail, particularly at 5,300. But even at 6K, he just gives you a pretty high floor because rebounds are typically pretty stable. Um, he's going to you know, pick up a couple assists, and then it's you know he's going to get some shots up. So I, I do really like Barnes, particularly on FanDuel. Nice. Um, now the rest of the uh, Raptors team, I think we got some good options here. Fred Van Vliet hasn't been quite as uh, productive as I would expect to start the season, given that Kyle Lowry is no longer on the team. But – he had a good game last time um, where he got a – I think he had like 16 assists, so that's so kind of cool. And uh, Gary Trent has been starting. Like the first game they started Drogic, but since then it's been Trent. He's been playing huge minutes. And OG also playing really big minutes. So we know uh, 
I guess the other guy is Precious Achuba, who who's been starting. A little volatile. How are you prioritizing these guys? Yeah, I think they all look pretty good. They they typically all look better on FanDuel as well. Um, but Precious Achua, I think, you know, we've seen that in games where he's not in foul trouble, he's likely to play, you know, around 28 minutes. He's about a fantasy point per minute guy, so he still looks like he offers some value. Um, Van Vliet's usage is not as high this year as I expected it to be. He's only at 22.9%. Last year, without Siakam on the floor, he was up around, I think, like 28 or 29%. Um, but OG Ananobi is just taking on a much, much bigger scoring role. He leads the team in usage at 24.7%, uh, excluding Chris Boucher off the bench. So I think that it makes sense, you know, that Van Vliet's usage isn't as high as we expected, given that Ananobi's usage has jumped like five to six points since last year. Um, but Van Vliet's still playing massive minutes. He's still got, you know, a 23% usage rate. He's averaging about a fantasy point per minute. So I do think there's value there, but just not quite the type of play that, you know, I, I guess I would have assumed he'd be uh, without Siakam and with Lowry gone. Um, and then, you know, on a, on a related note, OG Ananobi at 6,500. I think like at first glance, it's sort of just like, oh, I can't pay that for Ananobi. But he's just in a completely different role this year than he has been in the past. I think that, uh, you know, he's still rebounding. He still uh, gets peripheral stats and then he's scoring more. So uh, not, not, I wouldn't say underpriced, but I, I think it's a pretty fair price for him. Great. Yeah. I think uh, we've been seeing him score more. So that's, that's been encouraging. Uh, all right. Let's, uh, let's move on to uh, Minnesota at Milwaukee. Now, Milwaukee is definitely a team we're going to be looking at because they got some guys out. Minnesota, I don't know if they're as exciting, but Carl Anthony Towns is always one of the top fantasy centers in the league. He's been playing uh, really big minutes so far. So how are you uh, handling Towns? Uh, I would like to roster him. I just don't know how easy it's going to be to get to him on this slate because um, I can't put him ahead of Giannis. But then you also potentially have Anthony Davis uh you know, like basically, I assume Westbrook's taking up a roster spot in most lineups. It's just, you know, uh, is Davis taking one also? Uh, so I think Towns looks great. Um, the ownership probably, or I think we could also see the ownership be relatively low. Right now, we have him projected at 7%, uh, which makes him pretty appealing. He's playing really, really well this year. 1.64 DraftKings points per minute, uh, playing big minutes, as you would expect, in competitive games. Since the start of last season, he's averaged 1.44 DraftKings points per minute. I think he likely settles in in between. Like I, I would, I expect him to be more productive this year than last year because he's not dealing with you know the COVID issues and and all the stuff he had going on. And the Wolves' offense should just be better, I think, with Anthony Edwards in his second year uh, and all of that. I, I don't anticipate Towns to keep producing quite to this level, but he's still going to be one of the highest upside guys pretty much anytime he's on the floor. Definitely. Now, Anthony Edwards has been producing more, like you're saying. His uh, usage so far this year is up to 28.7% from 26.4. And the assists are up as well, 4% uh, in the assist percentage. So he looks like he's taking a, a modest step forward in fantasy, playing uh, a lot of minutes as well. The price tag has uh, risen as well. He's around 8K on both DraftKings and FanDuel. Is he someone that you're going to go try to get in fantasy? Yeah, um, for the reasons you mentioned, you know, the, the increased usage rate is nice, but the assists are what really jumped out. Uh, last year, he averaged um, 6.3 potential assists per game. Uh, it came out to about 7.1 potential assists per 36 minutes this year he leads the team with 11.7 potential assists per game uh he's averaging about 36 minutes per game so you're, you're talking about an extra four to five potential assists per game um you know that that's typically going to be converted into a few extra assists and you're seeing that uh so far so um the shooting you know josh mentioned this morning that his shooting outside of threes has still been really, really inefficient. He's shooting unsustainably well, probably from three. But I think you can see those things even out too. So the combination of, of huge playing time for Edwards and then the multiple paths to a big game, whether it's from a lot of scoring or you know a, a lot of assists, I think that he still looks like a, a very strong mid-range option. Awesome. Uh, we do have a super chat from TJ Zwarch. So he says, hey, fellas, if AD is ruled out, who would you project for more FanDuel points, Precious Achua or Carmel Anthony? Now, I feel like yesterday, Carmel, he didn't really get much more playing time, so it'd just be more shots maybe. So uh, I don't know. I, yeah, but I, I mean, if Anthony's out, I mean, if Davis is out. Davis, uh, yeah. Yeah, then, that's then everyone's – 
Yeah, I think uh, for now we would probably say Carmelo then because we don't really know uh, and having that that roster spot saved for later uh, might be an advantage. Yeah, I, I would lean Melo. Like, I haven't projected for Davis to be out, but I would think that you're getting – like, if he's out, you know, and obviously we can talk about it more when we get to that game, but I think you would get a lot more minutes at center from, like, Howard and uh, and Jordan – but then Anthony would most likely step into a bigger role. Like, I, I think you could see 30 to 32 minutes uh, from Melo if Anthony Davis is out. Nice. That would be huge. Uh, now with the rest of the Timberwolves, D'Angelo Russell, it feels like he's getting deprioritized a little bit, uh, not playing as many minutes as we'd hope. And then Patrick Beverly is a new guy on the team. Maybe a reason for that. Malik Beasley is coming off the bench and he's not getting many minutes. I don't see much here. What do you see? No, me neither. I said this morning, I kind of liked Beasley at 4,400, but I just can't like, I really want to like him. I think that it's one of those prices where if he's like, if he's 4,400 all year long, he's going to have some tournament winning games, but he's just been so uninvolved. The usage rate is like non-existent at like 13%. He's not getting assists. He's not doing anything when he's on the floor, which isn't, really typical of his game in the past but yeah it's, it's been the case so far and so you know on a slate of this size it's pretty tough for me to get there uh and like you said russell he always gives you tournament upside but the playing time has been not too inspiring so far getting around 30 minutes while guys like edwards and towns are playing you know 38 39 minutes in competitive games so um certainly you know could be the game where russell goes and plays 35 minutes there's nothing really stopping him but that hasn't seemed to be what saunders or whoever's coaching minnesota these days wants to do yeah, it's been frustrating aside from the, the main guys in Minnesota, uh, mainly Towns. Now, on the other side, Milwaukee's got a nice matchup versus the Timberwolves. For them, they got Drew Holiday and Brooke Lopez continuing to be out. The only injury update here is Bobby Lopez or Bobby Porta, Portis is uh, probable today. So um, I think that might make it tough to get to, to Jordan Nawara. I know he's been the fan fave. Uh, but I'll start with Giannis. Uh, I mean, with, with Drew Holiday out, you got to expect that his numbers are only going to look better. And uh, he's probably the stud of the slate. The ownership reflects that. How, how are you handling Giannis today? Hoping to play a ton of him. I mean, it's on the one hand, it might be tough, like because you, you have the Lakers guys and then you also have Giannis that you would really like to get to. And there's not a ton of good value, but uh, he looks great. I mean, his... his Rates this year and his production this year are almost identical to what he did last year without Drew Holiday. Uh, so I totally buy into it. 1.73 DraftKings points per minute. He's got like a 34% usage rate. His assist percentage is up above 30%. Rebounding percentage is, is close to 20%. He's great. And if he's not in foul trouble and the game's competitive, you can count on him to play 34 to 36 minutes. Um, I, I think he's the top payoff option right now. Um, you know, if, if Davis gets ruled out, then it, easily becomes Westbrook. But uh, either way, Giannis is, is a top play tonight. Yeah, he's going to be uh, the go-to for me too, even though he's popular. It just seems like uh, the matchup, the minutes, the production is pretty far off the charts. Um, the only thing that could happen, I guess, is more injuries. Um, like, I guess if Westbrook was playing without AD and LeBron, like for instance, maybe that'd be a better play. But right, right now, Giannis is the top guy. Now, the uh, rest of the team, do you think that Portis comes, coming back means it's hard to get to Nora because he is a pretty good permanent producer? Yeah, I think Portis coming back makes it tough to get to the peripheral guys like Wara. Um, Portis is just a more productive player than guys like Tanasis Antetokounmpo or uh, Mamukulashvili, who is now in the G League. But uh, it, it makes it like I assume that Portis is going to play more minutes than Mamukulish really was as well. So it potentially takes minutes away. Like I think Nor I think Wara probably plays around 22, 23 minutes, which makes it so I can't really get to him at 4,500. The biggest question for me is just how many minutes does Portis play? Because he didn't play in the preseason. It was a hamstring injury, which makes me hesitant to, you know, give him a lot of minutes here, but there are front court minutes available with Brooke Lopez out. So uh, I I'm interested to see, you know, if he starts, I think, that would be a sign that maybe he's playing like 24 minutes or something. If he comes off the bench, I think 20 minutes is a pretty safe 
spot to be in. And at 4,300, 20 minutes of Bobby Portis can still get it done. Uh, definitely a spot where I would like, I want to pay a lot of attention to ownership because right now I think we have him projected for about 9%, which is very, very reasonable. I like taking shots on him there. If he gets, you know, if he steams up before lock and you're suddenly getting like 20 minutes of Bobby Portis that, you know, 20% ownership or something, then it starts to become less appealing. Yeah, that's definitely true because, uh, I mean, if this was a situation where he uh, wasn't coming back from injury, I think maybe 26 minutes would be the the expectation. But first game back, I have him at 21. I feel like the minutes variance is lower because of this injury situation. So that kind of hurts you in GPPs. Uh, One of the things in our boom bust tool is the standard deviation. So lower minutes variance means lower standard deviation, lower boom percent. Now, um, some of the cheaper guys on the slate are on this Bucks team. George Hill is 3,700 on DraftKings. He hasn't been getting the like great minutes, but he's been starting. So is he someone that you'd slot in just for some salary relief? Um, Allen or Hill? Hill. Yeah, it's – if better value doesn't open up, yes. But it, it's nice that – This game is the same time as the Lakers game. Uh, You don't have to make a decision like, you know, if this game was an hour earlier and we didn't have Anthony Davis news yet. Uh, George Hill basically doesn't do anything when he's on the floor with Middleton and and Giannis. Going back to his previous stint with Milwaukee, 10% usage rate, 10% assist percentage, 0.62 DraftKings points per minute with those guys on the floor. But he's 3,700. He's likely to play 26 to 27 minutes. Just being on the floor for that amount of time offers some value at that price, especially where you have a lot of guys you want to pay up for tonight and not a ton of, of really good cheap options. So um, if Davis is in and you can't or it's not as easy to go to guys like Dwight Howard and DeAndre Jordan and, um, you know, Monk, like Monk's fine either way. But uh, if the value on the Lakers doesn't look quite as strong because Anthony Davis is in, then it's going to make George Hill relatively look a little bit better. Yeah, uh, someone that's a little bit hard to, to click that name and, and put your roster spot on him, but uh, it's it's going to be hard to find someone at that that range anyway. So uh, someone to consider. All right, before we get to the next game here, I want to talk a little bit about our sponsor, Prize Picks. So they kind of are a prop betting site that that you make parlays basically, but it's available in most states where there's DFS. So a lot more people can play on there. Uh, that's because it's like a DFS version of props and you can use the promo code awesome for a hundred dollar first match uh, bonus. Now, um, basically what you do, you pick a few props and then you parlay them. If you win both, you get a certain payout. If you win one, you win, win a certain amount. Uh, so we got to come up with some props here for prize picks. What I threw down on the, the one I have the most confidence in is Wendell Carter Jr. under nine and a half rebounds. I mean, this is something that's not going to be very like relevant in DFS because he's not really a play tonight. So it's fun to get a little action on this. But I feel like with Bamba uh, competing with the rebounds as well as Franz Wagner, I don't know if Carter Jr. is going to be that 10 rebound of game guy so i feel pretty confident about that adam who are your prize picks props uh yeah i like the carter one um both of mine are from the orlando game as well uh, i like the over on 12 and a half points for jalen suggs you know we talked about him when we talked about orlando all the reasons i think that he is a good dfs play applies to the over on the 12 and a half points as well and then gordon hayward 18 and a half points uh, I like the over there also. Uh, he's been a little bit disappointing this year, but I think he plays big minutes here. I think it's a good matchup against Orlando. Nice. Uh, so make sure to check out the prize picks uh, app, promo code Osimo. All right. Uh, we got the Lakers at Oklahoma City Thunder. So I feel like if you liked last night's matchup with the Lakers in San Antonio, you're going to love this matchup with the Oklahoma City. Uh, I mean, the big news is LeBron is out that in itself will create a ton of value. In addition, Anthony Davis at the very end of the game, he banged his knee and then um, he did come back in, but he looked like he was in pain. So he's questionable today. First of all, what are you reading into that injury and how are you going to handle that in your lineups? Yeah, it's, it's really tough for me to get a gauge on because on the one hand, 
LeBron being out again. So I kind of thought they were just playing games yesterday and that they were going to sit LeBron yesterday and then sit Davis today. LeBron being out again, you know, obviously isn't what I was expecting to happen. And then it's tough to get a read with Davis because on the one hand, you know, I would expect him just to play through it. But on the other hand, it is a back-to-back. It's early in the season. They're playing Oklahoma City. Like they probably win this game even if Davis sits or they at least have you know, a good chance to. So um, I, it, it kind of just feels like a 50-50 to me. Um, I don't have a good feel for it one way or the other. It is nice that this is an eight o'clock game instead of a 10 o'clock game. Um, I, I think what I feel confident in is Russell Westbrook's going to be going to look great regardless. Um, he's a really, really good play just because LeBron is out. Davis is a really good play, obviously, if he's active because LeBron is out as well. So I anticipate getting to like, if we assuming we don't get news before seven o'clock. Um, I anticipate getting to a lot of Westbrook, a lot of Davis, and then just being ready to late swap. Um, you have, Carl Anthony Towns starts at eight. Giannis starts at eight. Uh, Lillard is later on in the night. Morant's later on in the night. So you have plenty of guys, you know, plenty of high upside, like top tier guys that you can get to if if uh, Anthony Davis is ruled out. So I, I think late swapping should be pretty easy. Nice. All right. We got a super chat from Sweet Lou, and I, I might have to ask for an assist on this one. He says Matic, M-A-T-I-C, slash Polygon or George Hill for cash. So I have no idea who this first person Maddox he's, slash he's, he's, he's plugging crypto. Uh, Maddox. Uh, oh, uh, okay. I haven't heard of Maddox. I've heard of Polygon though. Are, are you in the crypto streets at all? Uh, a little bit. Not as much as I should be. Definitely not as much as I should be. Do you like the crypto more than George Hill and cash? I like pretty much everything more than George Hill and cash. <laughs> okay. Well, there you got your answer. Thanks for the super chat. Um, all right. So with the Lakers yesterday, Malik Monk got the start. He played uh, pretty good minutes and put up a, a winning fantasy score today. I think he was like 4,100 yesterday on DraftKings. Today he's 3,700. We pretty much know he's going to start, uh, unless I guess the way Ellington being back, like, I guess he could start, but most likely Monk. And I have a feeling everyone's just going to go right back to the well. Are you going to be doing that? Yeah, I, I think they should. Uh, he's someone that, you know, going back to his time in Charlotte, he's always had the ability to to score in bunches, which is nice. Uh, whereas, you know, you compare it to like Kent Bazemore, uh, Bazemore typically not going to be the, the best scorer. Like when he has big games, uh, it's more likely to be, you know, defensive stats and, and rebounding and stuff. Uh, Monk, obviously, he's still not going to be a high usage guy, especially if Davis is in also, but uh, just the better scorer out of the two, I think. And then also should, I, I would think, have a pretty long leash here with how well he played last night. Um, I think he was like plus 35 or something in that game like something insane i'm trying to pull it up now but i'm uh, pretty sure i saw that on twitter earlier so uh, i'm expecting him to start and his price tag i think actually came down a little bit from yesterday to 3700 so uh, he looks like one of the best values to me right now yeah definitely he, he looks like a lock and load play to me like even though I, I could definitely see this getting away from him because there's plenty of guys that can fill this role on the team uh I guess maybe they're a little, little bit shorthanded too, which helps them. But Avery Bradley didn't play really. So uh, there are some guys waiting in the wings. Now, Austin Reeves is a guy that I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with, uh, but he got pretty good minutes last night. He's only 3K. I saw someone in chat mention him. It looks like he's not going to be a great permanent producer. So I'm not really getting to him now. Do you see any reason to, to look at him? I mean, the reason would just be the playing time and the minimum salary price tag. Um, he's averaged 0. 0.52 DraftKings points per minute so far this year, only 60 minutes, but not like he's any sort of prospect or anything undrafted out of Oklahoma. Uh, so, like, yeah, if, if, like if Davis is in and so it doesn't just open up everything for the better Lakers, you know, that, that you would rather get to, like if you're playing 150 lineups, it's still fine. He projects okay for a 3K play on a slate where we'd like to find value, but uh, certainly not a priority for me just because – uh, he doesn't do a whole lot on the floor. It, it, it's pretty similar to me to the Herbert Jones play from uh, New Orleans. Definitely. The one guy that uh, is really standing out to me is Westbrook on FanDuel at 8,400. I feel like with no LeBron, like that's a, maybe a lock play, like because he's going to have so much more assist potential. I mean, Westbrook at 8,400 last year would probably be like a smash lock. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, Westbrook, I, I kind of just think that 
regardless of Anthony Davis, he's one of the top plays here. Uh, he really just needs one of LeBron or Davis to be out, and it kind of solidifies his role. Um, I, I think that when this team's fully healthy, he's still going to be a high upside guy, but he's just going to be really prone to disappearing in you know some games. But when you take LeBron out, it puts the ball in Westbrook's hands a lot more. Uh, you know that when he like he, he's going to get stats. He, he just that's what he does. Uh, and you know for pretty much all of his career, he's had one other you know ball dominant like kind of star next to him whether it was Kevin Durant or uh, James Harden or Beal or you know whoever it's not like uh, these big fantasy years that he's had have been you know just where he's the only guy on the team so uh, with him having just Anthony Davis out there I think he's arguably the top play on the slate if Anthony Davis is out then it just becomes you know ridiculous because you're going to get more rebounding opportunities I would assume you're going to get probably more usage uh it just he, he already is great and if davis goes out i think it just gets even better nice uh well i wish we could spend uh all show talking about anthony davis and russell westbrook because i'm pretty confident in those guys so it makes us look really smart yeah but uh let's go to the thunder now i'm seeing a couple of decent fantasy options here lou dort he didn't really work out for us last night but he's 4500 he has been getting decent usage. Uh, he was at 21% last year, 18 and a half so far this year. And the assists are up this year. So I'm thinking that maybe his usage will go back up and the assists will go back down. Been getting good minutes. The main thing is he's 4,500 on DraftKings. So there's not many guys that fill that, that salary range. But at the same time, I just feel a little uncomfortable with like investing too much of my my uh, lineups into Lou Dort. What do you think? Yeah, that's where I'm at as well. I'd feel differently if he weren't projected to be popular, but he's just not the kind of guy that I really like getting a lot of if you know a quarter of the field is, is going there or 20% of the field's going there. Um, it's just pretty unlikely. Guy. I think he's a good point per dollar option at 4,500. He's likely to play, you know, mid thirties in minutes. Uh, he has shot really, really poorly this year. So that's something else where, you know, maybe you see that usage go up when he's actually making shots and obviously his fantasy production would go up. Um, but he's just someone that typically I think is a much better NBA player than fantasy option. Uh, he's elite defensively, really, really fun to watch on that end, but you don't get fantasy points for that. Uh, so you know, I think he's fine at 4,500. It's more so I just kind of look at it like if 20% of the field's going there, where's the edge in rostering him? It's just he's not the type of guy that's super likely to put up a raw point score that you have to have, you know, that you can't match somewhere else. And he is relatively likely to disappoint and get, you know, 18, 20 fantasy points to where you actually have an advantage if 20% of the field has him and you don't. So um, I just don't think that it's that difficult to get guys that have similar upside, even if they don't project quite as well. Yeah, I feel like the thesis of the play, to, to quote uh, one of our good friends of the show, is that it's all the other guys you can get in your lineup around them. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, Dort's one of the cheap guys that you can look at. Shea Gilgis-Alexander, he, uh, I'm a little bit worried about the assist percentage going down because Josh Giddy seems to be handling the ball a decent amount. So I'm not sure he's going to be as good as last year with Shea, I mean, Shea's not going to be as good as last year, but his price has gone down a lot. He's only 7,100 on DraftKings and FanDuel. So that's just way too low for a guy that's supposed to be one of the high, like up and coming stars. I don't know. Are you going to be having a lot of Shea tonight? Yeah, um, I, I'm with you. Like, I'm a little concerned about the assist numbers. The potential assists have gone down. The assist percentage has gone down, and there's a pretty obvious reason for it in Josh Giddy. But at this price tag, it doesn't really matter. It, it's not like Gildas Alexander's not going to get any assists. He's just not going to be at the same level he was last year. But his usage rate this year is almost identical to last year, up around 28%. He's likely to play you know, 34, 35 minutes if this game's competitive. And the price tag is just really, really favorable. To me, he's a lot more scary to not have at high ownership than someone like Lou Dort because Gildas Alexander, a pretty decent amount of the time is going to go out there and throw up 50 fantasy points to 7,100 Lou Dort, you know, maybe he does it occasionally, but I'm kind of just willing to lose if uh, Lou Dort puts up some score that I can't match anywhere else. Gildas Alexander, much, much more likely to do it. Definitely. I think he's a, a solid mid range play today. Uh, let's go to Sacramento and Phoenix. Uh, I think this one should be pretty quick because Phoenix is a, Pretty solid defensive team, and there's no one really out for Sacramento. So, I mean, maybe take a shot on Fox. Do you see anything here? No, not really. Like you said, the, they're pretty much healthy. They're they're priced for for who's active. All I really see is 
uh, you know, yeah, De'Aaron Fox is capable of having massive games. He shouldn't be popular on this slate, which means that uh, he's a good contrarian guy to, you know, mix in this lineups. But um, outside of the very obvious statement that De'Aaron Fox is good at basketball, I don't have a whole lot to say there. Uh, Davion Mitchell. Uh, Davion Mitchell, I think, is a good example of somebody that you could use in Lou Dort's price range as a lower own pivot. He doesn't project as well, but he has a path to minutes. Uh, yesterday, um, Walton came out and basically said that he anticipates his closing lineups to always include Fox, Barnes, and Holmes, and then the other two spots to just kind of be uh, dependent on how the game's going and how guys are playing. So there is at least a path. We saw it last time uh, for Davion Mitchell to get those closing minutes, get up to 28 to 30 minutes. Uh, and, and, you know, he offers similar per minute production as Dort. So that's the kind of guy that, I, I understand why Dort's higher owned, but I don't mind the idea of, of pivoting to some guys like Mitchell. Um, but outside of that, I just don't really see a whole lot for Sacramento. Agreed. On the Phoenix end, uh, I don't see a ton either. Devin Booker and Chris Paul haven't been playing quite as many minutes as last year. I think that's mostly due to the bench getting hot probably, but the pricing isn't great either. Um JaVale McGee, like he's 3,100 and he's been getting uh, about 13 minutes a game. So that is a good points per dollar play, but it's JaVale McGee. What are you looking at here? Yeah, I mean, McGee's one of those where like if Davis is ruled in and you don't get Dwight Howard and DeAndre Jordan kind of jumping to the top, uh, then McGee makes some sense. You're assuming he's going to play like somewhere in the 12 to 15 minute range behind DeAndre uh, behind DeAndre Ayton, but McGee is so good on a, a, a you know per minute basis that he can give you a good score for his salary in that amount of time. And then there is a high ceiling because if Ayton were to get in foul trouble or something, um, and McGee picks up a few more minutes, then he's likely to just break the slate. So uh, I do have some interest in large field tournaments looking to McGee. I'm interested in Paul and Booker too, like. I think Phoenix is just pretty cheap on DraftKings, uh, not to the point where they stand out as top options. But um, for example, you know, I, I we talked about it, you know, liking Shea Gilgis Alexander. But if you're if you have a lineup where you already have a bunch of popular plays and you're looking to uh, get away from him a little bit, I think Chris Paul at half the ownership makes perfect sense. Uh, he's a very productive player. He's averaged 1.23 DraftKings points per minute since last year, which for context is the exact same as Damian Lillard. Uh, He just doesn't play as many minutes as those guys, but um, you know, the, the upside is still there. So I think Paul in tournaments, Booker in tournaments makes some sense, but uh, not, you know, not my highest own guys. Nice. All right, guys. Awesome.com hall of fame. So the rules are, you got to have the avatar, go to awesome.com slash avatar. And if you place the in the top three of a contest with 5,000 people or more, you get a free month of Osmo Plus Platinum. Make sure to tweet the wins for Osmo Hall of Fame account. Uh, and uh, it's always good to, to see the community having a lot of success. So the top of the Hall of Fame this uh, today is Lox262, Jordan Lockhart. I mean, I had to do a double take because uh, – I was like, this guy just tweeted us this win. Like, is he tweeting like the same screenshot again to the Hall of Fame? I'm like, what? But no, he wasn't because the day after winning 138K in NFL, he won 70K in NBA. So a total of 200K in two days. Major congrats to Jordan. The Awesome Hall of Fame is all about setting personal best. So we got Lad Daddy, Zach. He finished first at 4,500 4, on Yahoo. Uh, and this was a micro stakes contest. So he had a, a great ROI. So congrats to Zach. We got Brandon J. Baker. He, uh, he went in the single entry tournament that second. It's easy when you got 150 lineups, let me tell you, but when you got one, pretty tough to get in that that echelon. So congrats to Brandon. Daddy Dak, he finished first in the, the showdown, Indiana, San Francisco. That was uh, Sunday night. And uh, major congrats to, to Daddy, Daddy Dak. And Adam, he, uh, he had a pretty good night in NBA finished on top of several different tournaments, including first in the, the mid-range. And uh, it's not just NBA and NFL. We got Spuffer finished uh, first in the NHL big tournament. I uh, gave a shout out to our guys, Josh and, and Slim Cliffy on our NHL show. So if you want to get in those NHL streets, make sure to check them out and congrats Spuffer. All right, Memphis at Portland. 
Um, Memphis, uh, we mentioned Jaron Jackson earlier, like a um, guy that's been really injured throughout his career, but now it seems like he's healthy, really good permanent producer. The minutes are the big thing that, like, I feel like he has a lot of minutes volatility based on the matchup. They, uh, they start two bigs in Memphis, Jackson and Adams. Portland's front court is going to be um, – you got Nurkic and uh, Robert Covington, so a little bit of a smaller front court. Basically, I, this one is how you read the matchup. So, wh- how are you handling Jared Jackson today? Yeah, I mean, it's it, like, like you said, the playing time hasn't been exactly what we would like this year, but I still think that you can expect around 30 minutes from him if he stays out of foul trouble. Uh, at a $6,600 price tag, I think he's kind of a marginal play as far as I wouldn't expect to get to him in cash games. Um, I think he's priced about where he should be, but he does have a high ceiling. He gives you some, um, you know, defensive side upside. Uh, he can rebound. He's playing with the second unit as well, which is nice. So far this season, he's averaged 1.02 DraftKings points per minute, only a 20.5% usage rate. I think you can see that come up as the year goes on. Um, but he just he, he's a solid tournament option, I think. Nothing I'm going crazy with, though. Yeah, I might go crazy with him, but uh, yeah, he's he's expensive at 6,600. So maybe maybe just a, a good GPP guy to mix it up. Uh, DeAnthony Melton is going to be quite popular on today's slate. He's been getting the start with Dylan Brooks kind of on the uh, on the shelf to start the year. Now, Melton is a point guard, basically. So I don't know, like, if he's the best team fit with John Moran, but he's a good fantasy producer. Do you think he's worth the hype? Yeah, I've been encouraged by Memphis's rotation as well. Uh, obviously, Morant plays a lot of minutes, but Melton's been on the floor for most of the minutes that Morant is not. Um, 91 total minutes played now this year for Melton. 20.2% usage rate, 1.03 DraftKings points per minute. He's a good NBA player. The minutes have kind of always been the biggest thing for him. Uh, typically, in previous years, he just wasn't playing as much as I think most DFS players would like him to. But the playing time's been there. So uh, he's someone that, you know, the way the slate looks right now, I think he's one of the better value options at 5K. He certainly takes a step back if you get, you know, Anthony Davis ruled out and all that stuff opening up on the Lakers. Uh, but you know, I think it's a good spot against Portland. I think um, he should play 28 to 30 minutes at around the fantasy point per minute uh, pace. Yeah, I think he's interesting. Now, John Morant, he's almost 10K now. And I don't think he's a 10K player, like, because he just doesn't rebound. And almost every 10K player contributes in points, assists, and rebounds. He's 9,500 on FanDuel, 9,600 on DraftKings. What's your read on John Morant? He's got... I think he has a low floor for his price. Um, I, I kind of feel similarly to him as I do when like Damian Lillard's like 10,200, like he's overpriced for his average production. And like you said, the, the lack of rebounding compared to a lot of the payoff options is a big deal, but he's also seen a massive bump in his usage so far. Uh, th- well, you know, we'll see how it goes um, over the rest of the year, but he's got a 37% usage rate so far this year. And I think it is worth noting that the Grizzlies went from Jonas Valanciunas to Steven Adams at center. So you went from a relatively high usage center to Steven Adams, who is not a high usage center. So they're, there's just right there, there's some usage to be had. And then you also have, you know, Morant just getting more time in the NBA and developing his game. It's it's not surprising at all. He has a higher usage rate than last year. It probably comes down from 37%. But um, I think that it's fair to think that he might just be a better DFS option this year than he has in the past. So when I see players like that, typically when they're popular, I like to go a different direction because they don't have the rebounding safety that other expensive players do. But when they're not popular, I do like getting there. So I think he's somebody that, again, uh, you know, he, he's not on the same level as somebody like Russell Westbrook or Davis if he plays uh, or, you know, Towns or Giannis. So it's not a, a priority. But I do think that, you know, he can go get 60 raw points, which is – really nice in tournaments on the Portland side uh we have Norman Powell questionable so that one will be a good one to watch out for in the late slate if he doesn't if he doesn't play Nas a little got a lot of minutes last game but he's not a terrific permanent player so I'm not gonna really like plan anything around that um obviously Dame Lillard is a great fantasy option, CJ McCollum and, and Nurkic. Is there anyone standing on DFS? Uh, Lillard's price on FanDuel is absurd at 8,200. 9,400 on DraftKings is fine as well. He's off to a really, really poor start this year, but 
it's still Damian Lillard. Uh, you kind of know what you're getting from him. And over the course of the season, he's easily going to pay off $8,200 a lot. $9,400, I think, still offers some upside there. In competitive games, you're typically getting 37 to 38 minutes. He's a 1.2 to 1.3 fantasy point per minute guy on average. Uh, so I think uh, a much better play on FanDuel, though you also, you know, you can only roster the two point guards there. Uh, or I guess, you know, two and a half now kind of with MPE. But um Westbrook being such a good play and also being cheap makes it makes Lillard a little bit less of a priority, but I, I do like Lillard a lot. Um, I'm with you as far as, you know, the Powell versus little thing. If Powell's ruled out, I think this year little becomes a very good value based on how many minutes he uh, played last game, but he's not a good enough fantasy producer that I'm like, you know, planning around it and, you know, focusing on that. Like I am with the Lakers, uh, Nurkic, McCollum, both look fine. Uh, not, not priorities for me at their prices, but um, there's plenty of upside here on, on Portland. Nice. One there thing I go. forgot to mention on the Memphis side, I do like Steven Adams a lot at 5,300 on DraftKings. Nice. Um, all right, we got one more game. Four minutes left, so we got to speed through this one. Cleveland at LA Clippers. So, Coro is doubtful for this one. But, uh, I mean, tough matchup from an offensive standpoint, but the pricing isn't great either. But Evan Mobley has been pretty solid for a rookie. You got Markinen, who's been playing a bunch of minutes. Honestly, like mostly just start to throw a contrarian plays here for me. What do you what do you make of it? Yeah, that's where I'm at as well. Just a pretty much healthy team with Garland back. So there's nothing price wise that really stands out. Uh Colin Sexton, like you said, dart dart throw, you know, high upside guy. I think that's where I would get first if like you told me I had to play a Cleveland player, but there's not a whole lot here. Yeah, one thing from a betting standpoint, make sure to go to our props tool uh for all these picks, but Darius Garland's supposed to be back today, and Ricky Rubio's props are as if he's starting from what I've seen. So if you can get some assists and, and points under on Rubio, I think that could be a good bet. All right, on the Clippers side, uh, Marcus Morris is out for this one. Last time we saw them start Batum, but he didn't play a ton of minutes last game. It was Kennard kind of going off. I, I kind of see that as I'm just riding the hot hand, so... I don't know if I'm going to get to Kennard today, even though he's pretty amazing the other night. But uh, what's your read on it? Yeah, I think Batum is the guy that I want to get to here. That game got out of hand as well. Uh, the Clippers won by like 30 points. You had uh, Batum play 22 minutes in the first three quarters. No starter for the Clippers played at all in the fourth. Uh, based on his rotation, I think you're looking at 28 to 30 minutes if tonight's game's competitive. And at 3,600, that's pretty solid for someone that averages about three quarters of a fantasy point per minute. Kennard still has a ceiling at 4K. Um, you know, he's going to still have a role in this team. There's plenty of minutes available for him and he's certainly capable of getting hot. But I do think that there's always a tendency for people to look at a situation like that, where, you know, it's the first game where Morris gets ruled out and that coincides with Kennard making every shot that he takes. And people just say, Oh, Kennard with Morris out is a lock. Um, I, I definitely wouldn't go that far. Uh, he's somebody that, you know, again, you can kind of use as like a lower owned pivot in the Lou Dort price range. I think that's fine. But I think, you know, concluding that Luke Kennard's like a must have because of what he did last game is a mistake. Yeah, I'm kind of on Batum. Uh, he was pretty heavily featured last year when guys were out. So, Kennard, they did sign him to that big contract last year, so there is some reason to believe that the organization likes him, but uh, definitely not someone I'm going to go to after a big game. One guy I do like is Zubats. I feel like the first two games of the season, the Clippers were matched up against small teams. Last night, or maybe it was two nights ago, but anyway, they, he was matched up against a more traditional big. He went out and played a lot more minutes. Today, they're up against Cleveland, who's starting Jared Allen and also has basically another center with Mobley. So I'm thinking this is a spot where Zubats could play a lot of minutes and he's really cheap. What do you think? Yeah, I'm right there with you for you know a couple of reasons. The, you know, you mentioned playing a, a more traditional center here. If you look at the game against Portland, he played 25 minutes. That was only in three quarters. He played basically all of the minutes, almost all the minutes that Nurkic played, uh, you know, Zubats was on the floor as well. Now you get another traditional center in Jared Allen for him to go up against, but then also Morris being out, that's a key piece of those small lineups they use. So it makes it, you know, less likely that they go that route anyway. Uh, I think that, you know, on average, you're probably getting like 26 to 28 minutes from Zubats here, but it wouldn't be surprising if, you know, if this game's competitive, if he played even more than that. Uh, I think that he's a very, very good tournament play at 4,800. Nice. So, Hopefully you guys got some good ideas here. 
Uh, we got a full another hour and a half leading you up to lock with Eric and Greg and then talking some prize picks after that. So, guys, good luck tonight and stay tuned. Uh, make sure to catch all the breaking news up to lock. All right, Adam, man, fun doing a show again. Yeah, for sure. Good. on everybody welcome to the nba live before lock show presented by prize picks i'm eric lindquist we're going to be taking you guys all the way up to the 7 p.m eastern time 4 p.m on the west coast lock time just like we always do we're running it back same crew that we had yesterday is myself hosting and it will be the one greg ehrenberg at g ehrenberg dfs on the twitter spheres check him out uh he's going to be giving you all the great hard-hitting analysis greg how you doing my dude yeah, and uh, we're coming off a, a good night, you and I. A, a lot of close calls, because you were, for people who weren't aware, Eric was at the top of the $4 on FanDuel for a, for a good portion of yesterday's slate. And I had a chance to catch him with the Nikola Jokic lineup, which uh, obviously that burned out in the second yeah. half. But overall, I had a profitable night. I assume it ended up being profitable for you as well, even if it wasn't the $100,000 winning. Hey, any time you make, you know, four figures on any site, given it was just like literally at the thousand dollar mark, I was very happy, did well in that tournament, did well over on DK. It was your analysis. I mean, we just kind of jammed in a lot of that Lakers chalk, a lot of Westbrook, a lot of Davis. Everything worked out really, really nicely. And again, anytime you open up your phone, because I was kind of doing some busy work and I'm like, oh, I'm winning a hundred thousand dollars. That <laughs> doesn't feel very comfortable. I thought I was cheering for overtime, but then I guess you kind of need Dwight Howard and Kent Bazemore to be on the floor uh, if you're going to cheer for overtime. So I was probably cheering for the wrong thing, but I'm looking forward to running it back again tonight. I feel pretty confident because I got you helping me out, but help yourself or help all of us out here at Osmo by hitting that like button, hitting that subscribe button, hitting that notification bell. You see, you know, when this and all the other content goes live, Greg, I'm going to kind of start this off in a Josh Engelman way. What do you see kind of being the big calling card for this slate? What kind of news are you, you keeping your eye on here? Uh, I mean, obviously, let's start with Anthony Davis. Yeah. Am I allowed to answer or just Anthony Davis? Yeah, no, I kind of like wanted to not sound like an idiot there at the back end. You know, I just kind of like saved myself because I was like, well, obviously Anthony Davis, but I didn't know if there was anything else that was sticking out to you on this slate. No, and it's really only Anthony Davis, who I don't have in my projections right now. I'm assuming that Anthony Davis does not play, kind of like yesterday when we were doing the show. I said, I don't think LeBron James is going to play. And uh, it's kind of, I, I, I've kind of mapped this out in advance because yesterday afternoon I tweeted, I don't think that LeBron James is going to play tonight. I don't mm -hmm. think Anthony Davis is going to play tomorrow. So nothing's really, I mean, could he end up playing? Sure. And then I'll have to adjust. But as of now, nothing's happened since yesterday afternoon that's going to make me think differently than that Anthony Davis isn't going to play tonight. Then also that 
he suffered what uh, looked to be a career ending injury, which he <laughs> suffered like he has like three, four career ending injuries per night for, for Anthony Davis, but he's down, he's rolling on the ground, holding his knee last night and uh, ends up not even, not even missing a play. Uh, but he's listed as questionable officially on the injury report today. I assume that he's not going to play and it's going to be all the Russell Westbrook. That's right where I'm at too. I don't think Anthony Davis is playing. I mean, when that happened in real time, our group thread just blew up because I thought he was done for his life. He was screaming in pain. LeBron James came over and then all of a sudden he stood up and he didn't leave the game. It was the weirdest thing that I can ever, well, it's not it weird because it's Anthony. It wasn't Davis. the weirdest thing. He's going to do it. He's going to do it again this week at some point. He does it. He does it all the time. Uh, but it is funny because it, since it hasn't happened yet this year, it's easy to overreact to it happening. You just be like, oh my God, Anthony Davis, he's done. And it's like, oh no, that happened. This happened 40 times last year. So it's a regular occurrence. Uh, but I, once again, I am right now expecting that he's not going to play, which opens up all the value in the world once again on the Lakers. Oh yeah. We're going to be looking at a lot of that here, but kind of what we always do. We start this off at the guard position. So we're going to group it together by guard. We're going to group it together by forward. And then we'll round out with center here. I think that that was a good way of doing it because we have so much multi-positional eligibility that exists on DraftKings and FanDuel now. I think it just makes a lot of sense. We've got spend ups at the point guard position. We also have a guy who's not necessarily priced like the entire spend up. I mean, he's 9,300, so it is technically there. But James Harden at 10K. The Nets are on a slate, Greg, and I do remember you saying on a show previously that you have made money on every slate that the Nets have not appeared. Well, the Nets are appearing, and you don't make money on these slates. So uh, how much, James Harden, are you going to be going down with the ship tonight? Yeah, I'm not really getting to all that much James Harden right now. Also, a uh, little uh, note here, I'm playing only on FanDuel tonight, not on DraftKings, and I wasn't able to play on both sites. I have a friend visiting. And uh, that's going to make it really hard to manage. Well, but honestly, it's going to make it hard to manage either of them. So hopefully there's no kind of crazy news. Probably dumb for me to play in general, just considering <laughs> Anthony Davis has lifted this question. But, but, but we sail on. I, I'm not getting to all that much of James Harden. I have him. I have some exposure to him right now in the teens. But every other net slate this year, I've gone super heavy on James Harden. He's been a core part of my lineups. And uh, he just hasn't looked like the same player so far this year. So I've kind of dialed back my overall expectations for him this year. I think there's a couple of things at play. Number one, Steve Nash said the other day that James Harden's still not over the hamstring injury that he suffered last year in the regular season in the playoffs. That's a concern. There's been a considerable amount of time off. And then also he's complained about the, the, the refing situation and the change in the rules that he think it's specifically targeting him, which kind of to an extent is true, but at the same time too, it was you know a rule that I think is much better for the overall uh, watching of, of, of basketball. And there was a lot of non-basketball plays. They're getting called fouls. And I think he's struggling to adjust to life without being able to kind of foul bait in the same way. So if you look at the free throws for James Harden this year, uh, opening night against the Bucks, four, four, one, three since, since opening night. So he hasn't attempted more than four free throws in a game. That's always been a core part of how James Harden scores fantasy points. It's also been less aggressive as a result of that. So his usage has been down. He hasn't been making shots, and that's going to certainly be something that bounces back a little bit. But there's just other guys I'd rather spend up for. Not 0% of them, but he's not, he's not an important play for me today. So I'm assuming one of those guys at the guard position is going to be Russell Westbrook. Uh, I mean, we can kind of start there. How much Russell Westbrook is too much Russell Westbrook tonight? Uh, none. I, like, there, there is no number that's too high. Agreed. Like, uh, 100% on FanDuel and DraftKings is totally acceptable. I mean, that's what I have right now on FanDuel. Okay. I, I am right now going to wait on the AD. So I think the AD news has a trickle down effect as far as what I kind of am expecting. Not necessarily that I don't want to still play a ton of Russ Westbrook, but Anthony Davis becomes another guy that I want to be putting a lot of salary towards and somebody that I want to roster. And so I'm kind of setting up some late swap tools to, to kind of help me out with that. That game starts at 5 p.m. out here on the West Coast, so 8 o'clock there on the East Coast. And the other game that you're kind of sharing with that time slot is Minnesota-Milwaukee, but you still have Sacramento-Phoenix, Memphis-Portland, Cleveland Clippers. I think there's a number of ways to kind of work. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to still uh, have at least 15% Anthony Davis exposure, even though I don't expect him to be playing. And then if that news were to break 10 minutes beforehand, I'll see what I can do to try to, try to get more of it in that spot because I think he'll just be a little bit underutilized. But... I'm in the same mind as you where Russell Westbrook is just such a smash. It's, it's ridiculous. 
said happy Russell Westbrook night uh, as if yesterday wasn't good enough. I think he runs it back here again tonight, but any of these other options, John Morant, Damian Lillard, uh, Bradley Beal, even uh, going up against Boston 9,200 is 2%. And I think 2% of Bradley Beal on DraftKings is probably way too low. Trey young is starting to get a little bit of ownership there. Anybody else that you're getting to on the top end? Um, in terms of like the very top end, if I have, you know, I have a hundred percent of Russell Westbrook right now, that kind of makes it so it's hard to get to any other player on the high end at a really significant number. Uh, I have a lot of exposure to, to Shy Gilgis Alexander again. I have him as, as a core play for me. And I don't know if we're quite considering him to be that high end of a play, but once again, he's, there's a different price tag on him in between FanDuel and DraftKings, same as yesterday, but that's 7,100 price tag on FanDuel. It's not enough. The last couple of games, 52 and 39.9 fantasy points, he's not priced correctly. We talked about yesterday and basically all the same stuff applies. And then also we have him against the Lakers team that right now doesn't have LeBron James. We don't expect it to have Anthony Davis. The, the potential starting lineup for the Lakers today could really be awful defensively. So I think this is a, a pretty favorable matchup for the Thunder. Agreed. It's it's really, really good. Shea Gilgis Alexander, if anybody's not playing on FanDuel, do it and play him there. 7,100, I think, makes a lot of sense. Even on DraftKings, I don't think he's completely priced out of the slate. Plus, when you have guys like we're going to be getting to a copious amount of Lakers, it makes a lot of sense to have some of these OKC pieces. And he's definitely the priority, I think, if this game shoots out in any kind of way. He's the main beneficiary. Uh, 7,100, just a ridiculous, ridiculous price tag for him on FanDuel. Moving down the rest of the board, is there anybody else? We've got some popular plays, too. DeAnthony Melton is somebody on the DraftKings slate. And Cole Anthony is popping up in a ridiculous amount of lineups for me, even at 6,100. I don't want to. I think I'm going to probably have to cap him. But any other popular plays that you're getting to? Um, we, can we group in Malik Monk here? Especially Absolutely. Because now, yeah. Now I, know, yeah. I know that you were uh, a little uh, dismayed with the amount of playing time. That, oh, by the way, uh, Karis LeVert officially ruled out. Howell Neto also ruled out. Mm-hmm. I know you were a little dismayed with the uh, playing time that Malik Monk was getting yesterday because he was coming at the expense of Kent, uh, of Kent Bazemore. Did you see the plus minus for that game, the, the final results? I did. I saw that Malik Monk had a plus 31. It was the dumbest thing I've ever seen. In an overtime game for a player to be plus 31 is absolutely ridiculous. But I, I do think there's a little bit of logic to it from this sense. He gives the Lakers floor spacing that not, that not many other players on the roster can. So especially if I'm going to think that Anthony Davis is out today and it opens up extra uh, usage in that starting lineup. I think Malik Monk is going to get a ton of run, a lot of touches. So I think he's another guy, chalk play, but but rightfully so. Rightfully so, boom bust tools. So we always have to look at that. I, I know that Adam has talked about this a lot. The ownership is is really there. The optimal percentage, twenty five point three percent. So he is the most negatively le- leveraged player on the slate. But there are other paths that I can go where I can get some leverage. And specifically, the thing, the reason that I have fifteen percent Anthony Davis is. We're currently projecting him for no ownership because I think the public sentiment, as opposed to yesterday where we didn't know what was going on with LeBron, is I think we all believe that Anthony Davis now is going to sit in this spot. And in the event that he doesn't, uh, what a play to be able to have access to at 9,700. We'll see when that news ends up coming out. That's sometimes the dropping of the news and the timing of the news is as important as the news itself. That made me sound smart there for a second. Uh, that, I just sound full of shit. But here we go. That is the true, honest uh, fact of that. And Malik Monk is definitely a play that I think you need to be getting to in bulk uh, all over. Every single site, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I was the person I thought that projected him for the most minutes, but then it always works out that way, where you have like 60% of a guy, and then you're cheering against him because the lineup that's smashing is the one that doesn't have him in it. So uh, I, I definitely think Malik Monk, another play I'm going to have a lot of, Kent Bazemore as well. Uh, no, no problem getting to any of them, uh, kind of working our way down. Are there some lower owned? Are there some guys that are not necessarily popping in projection models here at Osmo? Anybody that's coming up positively leveraged in the boom bus tool, anything else that you're looking at for tournaments specifically that you want to do at guard? Uh, I think that, uh, Roger and Rondo should be picking up more ownership. A great and call. It, it's also something where, so if you do, it, this isn't going to answer your question. If you have anybody who's looking as positively leveraged in our boom bus tool, he looks negatively leveraged, but also keep in mind, we currently have Anthony Davis in our projections. And if Anthony Davis is ruled out, that's going to change a lot of the numbers here. Rondo's projected for 3% ownership on FanDuel and 10% on DraftKings, only 3,100. 
I think that he's somebody who stands to gain a lot with Anthony Davis potentially being out. And we've seen the Lakers even willing to play Rondo and Westbrook on the court at the same time. Rondo, even if he's not a particularly productive real life basketball player anymore, he still is for fantasy purposes. So I think that Rondo makes for a, uh, a really strong value play on this slate. Although I'm going to certainly back off if Anthony Davis ends up getting rolled in. How about Davion Mitchell? So this guy has now played 32 minutes in back-to-back games here. Uh, The usage was up to 25.6% coming off of being just at 11%. He's noted for his defense. Uh, Probably the coolest nickname, uh, Rin Pack on the Slade Starter Pod was telling me that uh, his nickname is Off Night. So it's like whoever he's guarding is going to have an off night. I think it's a pretty sick nickname. Somebody, wish somebody would come up with a cool nickname instead of like King Quist or whatever the hell. Uh, I would, no, I would wait, enjoy wait, that. What do they call you? King Quist or, you know, Chalk Quist or uh, Tinker Quist or I don't know. I have some really, really bad ones. Yeah, go ahead and spam the chat with all of the ridiculousness. Uh, I'm, Jordan Klein, I can see in his eyes right now, he's going for the Tinker Bell meme see i know you i know you so well you can't get away with it god why would you do this on cue god i know you way too well this is ridiculous god my employer is so mean to me whatever actually it's just jordan klein all right davion mitchell i like getting to him on this way, I mis- 4200 as a value i misunderstood piece. you I went, I went with kink quest i didn't know if that was actually i didn't know if that was one of the ones he said but that's what i'm going with for for right now eric eric kink quest I think that is, by the way, now we've got the, uh, the, the YouTube chat is just getting flooded with a, a bunch of names, but I think, I think a lot of people are going to be in on the, uh, the kink quest one. Kink quest. Oh, look at that. Instead of king quest. I, I like that. <laughs> I can't even say that one on stream. There we go. Uh, lots of things going on in the chat. Jordan Klein, always keeping it entertaining there behind the virtual glass. Thank you so much to him as he eats a muffin. Uh, he's just doing work. What is that? I don't even know. It looks like a muffin. All right. Davion Mitchell. Uh, do you have any interest in him? 4,200 for him. He's under 4K, I know, on the FanDuel slate. And so I gave him the little plus plus sign over there. Uh, I didn't see what his final ownership was uh, right now. We have him just under 10%. I think if you're trying to find savings to get up for, you know, get up to Anthony Davis, if you're going to be getting to a lot of Russell Westbrook, I think he makes a nice pivot off of some of the more popular chalk in Kent Bazemore and uh, Malik Monk. How about you? I, I don't have, let's see, do I have any exposure to, I don't have any, I don't have any lineups with Davion Mitchell in them. He's currently projected for right around 10% ownership on FanDuel, DraftKings, he's projected for 3% ownership. He's also more expensive at 4,200. It's a really difficult matchup for him against the Suns and something else that from a fantasy perspective is pretty concerning about his box score is he's not really doing much outside of scoring. And that's something also that I'm not sure he's going to be doing all that much of. Uh, it's it's not like we're seeing him take a ton of shots or anything like that. He had, you know, one game where he was super efficient, but first game of the season, he scored two points. Second game, he played 32 minutes. He scored three points. He did, he did happen to get it. He did happen to end up with four steals in that game, but that's not something I'm going to bank on happening again. So overall, I don't think Mitchell is going to be a great points per minute fantasy producer this year. If you look at his numbers in the preseason, he averaged well under a fantasy point per minute. Uh, same for even the summer league this year, where he's playing against other rookies. He averaged well under a fantasy point per minute. So I think this is a tough match for him against the Suns. I don't know that the minutes are going to consistently be over 30. So I, I end up put projecting for under 20 fantasy points. Oh, man, you guys are way too clever. Way too clever over there in the chat. Um, I'm still going to try to fire up a little bit. I think that finding a different way to get to different value. But Rajon Rondo on, on DraftKings, 3,100. That was the guy that I had circled. I'm only playing 40 lineups over there, so I'm not going completely nuts. I, I think that Rajon Rondo is definitely somebody that I want to be over the field too, no doubt about it. Um, especially, you know, once again, you get Anthony Davis off the floor there. Rondo's going to probably have 20, 24 minutes that we're looking at a minimum there. Um, 24, I would be thinking uh, they're going to need playmakers and, and they're going to need to find a way still to get it done. OKC's very, very winnable for him. So uh, love that call by you as well. Anything else at guard? Uh, let's see. Who are the other guards right now that I'm picking up a lot of exposure to? Um but Gordon Hayward, I guess we could talk about him when we get to God. Uh, to forward. But, but whatever, we can, we can group him in here. Why not? Uh, so Gordon Hayward, Terry Rozier out once again for the uh, Hornets. And you look at the price point on Gordon Hayward. It's got to be really cheap. He's only 6400 on FanDuel. And I still think there's going to be a bounce back here at some point. It's been a rough start to the season. His usage has been down. His efficiency has been down. 
But still, there's a long track record of Gordon Hayward being a good fantasy player. His price now, the 6,400, if you go back to last year, and that's also something I always reference at the start of the year is the historical pricing. He was priced over 7,000, even over 8,000 for the majority of last year. This is the cheapest price point he's ever had since coming to the Hornets. I think it's a good spot to buy low on Gordon Hayward. I doubt the price gets much cheaper than this. I doubt it does either, but I mean, I know Josh Engelman on the strategy show this morning, that was somebody that he was just adamantly, adamantly against. Um, I, I get it. I just think it's too good of a number at 6,400 on FanDuel. And this is also why it's great to play multiple sites. This is why we encourage you to try out these other places to go get exposure to players because Gordon Hayward, a little bit of a different play uh, from site to site. And, and I just think that, you know, looking at him on DK at 6,900, completely priced out of the slate for me. I know he's at 12.3%, but I don't have to play him there. And FanDuel, I'm able to get my exposure to him and, and kind of be able to uh, get a more advantageous tag. So I, I think that I'm going to be getting to him there as well. Um, looking at the rest of the guards here, I'm not going to try to chase anything that happened in that Clippers game outside of Reggie Jackson really sticks out to me in that late night hammer. I like to have late exposure in case injury news pops up, but it's still pretty early in the season. Uh, for whatever reason, maybe I, I just don't think people get scratched late uh, nearly as prevalently uh, this early in the season is what we're going to have a month, two months from now. So I'm not going to try to like uh, just backload a bunch of my lineups because especially that Lakers value impossible to get away from. But as we make also, our way over, I mean, four- but I'm going to say also, Go uh, sorry to cut you off, but we, that Lakers game does start relatively late. You know, that is a game that has mm-hmm. a later start time, not the quite 10 PM start time, right. but uh, we have a lot of placeholder lineups because that Lakers game, it's still the, there's only three 10 o'clock games. So that Lakers game is the next latest start time. So we do have a lot of our lineups, assuming that you're playing a lot of these Lakers value guys. A lot of it is held up in those Lakers plays. So we have the flexibility to swap for mostly any injury news that breaks later on. All right. Well, that is going to do it for the guard position. If you guys will, we'll get, we'll have a little bit of time for questions there at the very end. But uh, right now, if you want to be able to look at some of the stuff we're looking at, the projections, industry leading projections, the boom bus tool, which we refer to all the time on these shows, because it is truly I believe the best tool in the industry for NBA, uh, for NFL as well. We have the boom bus tool available. And if you want to check out every single sport behind the paywall is $29 and 95 cents for the Osmo weekly pass using promo code NBA live before lock all caps, one word NBA before live before lock, get 25% off your first week of Osmo plus platinum. Uh, you want to check out those player projections, ownership projections, the the premium Discord channel that we have fired up, the lineup builder, which is so much fun, the, the, the NFL lineup builder show, to be able to see the contrarian scores, to be able to see that directly on the screen if you're doing single entry, three max stuff. I'm telling you, it's so incredible how much work these guys behind the scenes are doing to put all of this data, all of these tools together for you. Take advantage of it now. That 25% off is going to go a long way for you. And if you want to check out just the Osmo Plus NBA Weekly Package, if this is the only sport you're interested in, $16.95 is where that can be found and $4.95 for the Weekly Express Package, which still gives you NBA Showdown and Single Game Contest. So stop guessing, start winning. Join us over here at Osmo Plus today. All righty, let's jump ourselves over to the forward position. We've got Giannis Antetokounmpo. I love Giannis Antetokounmpo. I think it's not too difficult, especially on FanDuel, to play Russell Westbrook, Anthony Davis, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and a lot of the same lineups. There's tons of value. This is what happens on a 10 gamers. You can be more selective and, you know, getting up to that top end makes sense. Giannis Antetokounmpo, 33.6%. Over or under that number for you today? Uh, over, but I also want to point out, I'm really confused by the ownership projection right now on DraftKings. I'm going to refresh to make sure it's still the most recent one. And oh, we just got one one minute ago, so this is going to be fresh. We haven't looked at it yet. Giannis is projected for way more ownership than Russell Westbrook, and I do not agree with that. We've got Giannis right now on DraftKings projected for 28% ownership. We have Russell Westbrook projected for 20% ownership. I think Russell Westbrook is the best play on the slate. 20% ownership for on DraftKings is just totally is totally wrong in my opinion if people are only playing him 20 percent, this is the best play we've seen of the season so far so i think Giannis is a really good play i'm overweight to him but i think that we should be heavier overweight to russell westbrook than we are to Giannis. yeah i mean there's i will say right now there is a zero percent chance i have less than 65 percent russell westbrook on on dk probably going to lock button him on fan duel at that number which is just 
8,400 is silly. Um, even if you were to get all three active. And again, I think they were trying to price him as if you were going to have LeBron and AD there finally so that he becomes somebody in play. But now it's kind of gone in reverse and done the opposite here. Um, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think the DraftKings, Russell Westbrook, that price is just ridiculous. I like that you're over, though. Going back to Giannis Antetokounmpo, uh, I think that we're looking at kind of a, your priority spend-ups. If you're just in a vacuum picking out your three best ones, uh, especially up against price, uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo, you could make him 12K on slates like this where you have tons of value, you get Lakers value, you get these other pieces that, you know, whether it's Davion Mitchell, whether it's, you know, somebody like Cole Anthony, even in the mid six Ks, a number of mid six K players, precious just Chua under five K on FanDuel. I mean, it's just so easy to be able to plug him into lineups and he's the best fantasy point per minute producer on planet earth. So uh, anything else to add to Giannis Antetokounmpo there? Now, are you getting notifications on discord? Because, um, Look, Larry C had said that we'd missed some stuff in Discord. I'm not getting notifications from it. Though. It's literally just me eating chalk, so I ignored it. Oh, is it? Is that what it is? I thought there was it's some. It's literally sort of... a picture of me eating the chalk on the baseball stream uh, because I'm was, a man of was... man of my word. I thought there was something. Uh, I thought there was something important here in terms of like questions we were getting asked. I'm looking no. through, like, why am I not getting notifications? Well, it's yeah, just me getting through. trolled, Greg. It's a day ending and why. Uh, actually, the best thing in here as I was going through is uh, whoever photoshopped. And by the way, this is the uh, the premium content behind the paywall. Let's see if people would see this. Whoever photoshopped Alex Baker with Mark Davis's haircut, <laughs> if somebody photoshopped and put that in our Discord chat, <laughs> which is absolutely hilarious. Oh, the boss um, man. Uh, he did such a good job on the previous show. Oh, my God. Man, that is something. Let me just say, that is that is the stuff nightmares are made of. Wow. Um, might need to switch that to somebody's Twitter avatar. That is beautiful. Alex Baker, he did such a good job on that last show. He perfectly segmented the times in a better fashion than any of the people who host every single day. That's kind of a shot at myself is what that was. Uh, let's be serious, but, uh, did an awesome job. Oh, we just got some, we got some news that we did not expect. Nick Claxton ruled out today. Uh, that's kind of fascinating because that's going to create what we call value. And I like value on slates like this. We'll kind of see what that opens up. But the first guy that immediately goes into my mind when I see something like that, we've got Patrick Mills. We've got Bruce Brown Jr. We've got these other guys coming off the bench. But now looking at the front court, you might be able to add some value to them as well here. LaMarcus Aldridge. Uh, it's pretty diluted. Paul Millsap. Uh, okay. I, I was excited at first and now I'm less in, enthusiastic. Anything that you're kind of noticing from that news? Uh, I'm, I'm going to like uh, Bruce Brown here because we saw Bruce Brown start for the Nets the other day, and they seemed to want to go a little bit more towards small ball uh, when they were resting. I can't remember. I think it was Blake Griffin who was resting the other day. Maybe it was Marcus Aldridge. But either way, Bruce Brown started last game, and now that there is a big man out in the in the front court, one of the reasons that we've seen Bruce Brown's minute pick up this year is the Nets have tended to go more towards bigger lineups. They don't have that option as much without Nick Claxton there. So I think Bruce Brown's minutes, as long as he's starting again, you know, he probably plays somewhere in the neighborhood of 28 to 32 minutes. Okay. I mean, that's going to be, that's going to be really good value. I mean, he was under 5%. I understood why people wanted to make him a thing at 3,700. Um, you know, the usage isn't going to be there in a, a crazy way. You're not going to see the 25% usage that you saw multiple times uh, throughout last season with him coming off the bench. You're going to see the stagger James Harden, Kevin Durant so far, Two games here, 27 minutes and 30 minutes after the the abomination that was opening night, uh, rostering Bruce Brown, good times. But 17.7 and 17.2% usage. He did start the last game. If he starts here again, 3,700, I think that that's somebody that should definitely get some traction. Half an hour beforehand, I think we're going to try. Uh, can you get anything out of that front court to upgrade? Uh, probably, but it's going to depend what the, what the net starting lineup looks like. Okay. And then we'll know from I assume we're going to get that starting lineup in a few minutes. That's a... Uh, 7.30 start time, not a 7 o'clock start time. But at the very least, we're going to get that in the near future. Something else that's kind of interesting about this slate, there's only one 7 p.m. Eastern time game. So we kind of are going to have all the flexibility in the world right up to 7.30. And also you and I, we're not just ending at 7 o'clock at lock time. We're doing the 30-minute prize pick show afterwards. So we're going to have 30 minutes to talk about any other news that happens, whether it's Anthony Davis being in or out at that point in time, the net starting lineup. There's going to be news that most likely happens from 7 to 7.30 that you and I are going to be reacting to. Yeah, not only that, but prize picks, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We we got to talk a little bit about it on the NFL ownership strategy uh, show this morning. Uh, Luffy, Makachevsky, myself, we 
we do a little round table every single Wednesday morning talking about the ownership as it starts to break down there. And I'm, I'm telling you, it's one of my favorite shows that I get to do on a weekly basis. And so go check that out. But we gave some women's Euro Tour basketball uh, picks. So check those out. Uh, I enjoyed that. Sometimes they have cricket. Sometimes they have uh, some some esports stuff to take advantage of. They have every single offering. But of course, we're going to talk a little bit more about NBA. Maybe we'll sprinkle in some NFL for fun, too, because that's that's what you can do on prize picks. Really, really great site. We'll talk about them later. But uh, making our way down the forward position. I see myself getting to a lot of Scotty Barnes right now on FanDuel. I see myself getting to about the field on Gordon Hayward. I think that we kind of are in agreement with him. The one guy that I just have zero of, and I'm just saying he's on the bottom end, not to go just completely down there, but I have zero desire, and I mean zero desire, to play Jay Crowder at 3,900 today. Do you have any of him whatsoever? Uh, no, but I also have to answer that. I'm going to, I'm going to speak aloud to Jordan and tech fish. I'm getting right now. I'm aware that my camera is out of focus. I do not know how to make it go back in focus. I'm trying different things to make it happen. Also, my microphone is selected. It's just uh, a little echo in here. I thought this was an artistic choice today. And I thought this was like, no, uh, was, like a little lens fine. flare. It was, it was fine before. I don't know. I don't know what it, there's something else that's making it out of focus. I don't know what it is. And it's really annoying. And now I'm fixated on, I'm looking at it over there, but no, uh, so Jake Crowder today, um, I have him, I mean, it's, it's a matchup against the Kings, which whatever, the Kings are playing at a really fast pace this year. That's all well and good. But Jake Crowder's numbers this year, the minutes just haven't been there for him. He had the one game against the Lakers where he played 35 minutes, opening night against the Denver Nuggets, he only played 24. Last game, although it was a blowout against Portland, he only ended up playing 24 minutes. I don't know that he's going to play a ton this year. I think we're going to see Bridges play more minutes. I think Cam Johnson is going to end up playing more minutes. But I think that somewhat stifles the upside of Jay Crowder, who already was not the world's best points minute fantasy producer. No, he's not. And part of also why I don't want to play him is I think Gary Trent for 700 more, way better play. Brandon Ingram, another play that I'm getting to a lot more than the field. Giannis Antetokounmpo, Scotty Barnes. So many great plays, I think, at small forward, contrary to what we've seen in previous years. So I'm, I'm getting myself to a lot more of the small forward position players that are not Jay Crowder uh, spending more salary in that spot. Again, Russell Westbrook, 8,400. It's not like we're paying a pretty penny for him. Uh, You know, I'd pay 10 K plus for him in this spot without LeBron. I'm pretty sure. So I'm, I'm happy to be using that money to go elsewhere at the position. Uh, Let's take a look. I'm going to DraftKings here once more. Let's look at the top end forward here. We've got Jason Tatum, Jimmy Butler. Uh, That's kind of a fascinating guy underneath 5% coming off of a game where For all intents and purposes, he was going to blow that slate apart. Only ended up playing 33 minutes. They blew out Orlando. He didn't play his last rotation. That would have been a 60-burger for sure, but I don't know. That's a pretty hefty price tag on this slate. Is there any kind of like tournament pivot you see on the top end of forward that you would be getting to? Uh, To Anthony Davis, not in particular. I think think if we're going to make some kind of pivot, it would just be to play some of the mid-range guys. Because it's not like there's anybody that's even comparably priced to him other than Kevin Durant. But, you know, once again, although FanDuel, at least uh, there's their same position eligibility, small forward, power forward. But I have Giannis projected way better than Kevin Durant. And I've been too low on Durant so far this year. But even so, there's a minimal price difference between the two. I think the projection for Giannis, at least for me, is significantly higher. So I can't kind of make that kind of pivot but if you want to go mid-range I think that's sensible but do you think Kevin Durant is a viable pivot off of Giannis or is there somebody else you're looking at I mean Kevin Durant has the low floor at that tag 10-5 but we all know what that ceiling is and that's that's really kind of the thing in tournaments is it's what is your like what is your ability to inherit that risk because is Kevin Durant even close to the kind of play that Anthony Davis would be at 9700 if you get him ruled in I don't think so but it's only eight hundred dollars more And you can't tell me that their ceilings aren't comparable. And Kevin Durant could just as easily put up 65 against Miami here in this spot. Uh, We just got an alert. Anthony Davis is going to be a game time decision. Buckle up, folks. Going to be a bumpy ride. Uh, Very excited for it. But uh, either way, yeah, Kevin Durant has a ceiling. I just think he's a product of this slate where I think that there's actually lower. um, So he's at 4.3% in our last run on DK. I think I would rather play Paul George for 200 less, at least for Paul George. I know that the usage is going to be 34% plus there as well. I know that it's the late night hammer where I can have some versatility, especially if that news breaks at 445, I'm able to get some more Anthony Davis. So right now I'm getting to more of Paul George just as a result of wanting to play the late swap game on DK. So I I think that 
stuff like that kind of makes Kevin Durant less appealing on this slate in, as a whole. Yeah, and uh, let's let's talk about the Anthony Davis game time decision situation because I think there's a lot of people that don't understand what game time decision means. It's not an injury status. So whether somebody's doubtful, questionable, probable, game time decision doesn't mean anything. It's just when the decision is going to happen. So at times we'll see somebody who could be listed as doubtful, but they're a game time decision. It still means they're doubtful to play. They're just going to warm up and see how they feel. Anthony Davis, it's the same situation. He's still questionable. I'm still assuming he is out, but the game time decision shouldn't really impact how you're viewing him for this particular slate. But, you know, once again, it's going to be a thing where we're not going to get the news for, you know, an hour or so. All right. We got a super chat here from David Paul. This is a question I think for you, because there are a number of factors that go into this, but how do you guys determine your ownership projections? Like Greg said, the Westbrook and Giannis numbers are out of whack. Great job, by the way, guys. Um, for yeah, I'll just let you take that here to start and I'll, I'll piggyback off you. It's an algorithm that we, ha- that we have on the back end where we run it and it comes up with, Hey, this is what we project the ownerships on based on a handful of factors. Uh, some of them, I don't know. Some of them I probably am not allowed to talk about, but it, it basically, it's an algorithm, no different than how you'd project, uh, fantasy points for any individual player. It's an algorithm that goes into it. It's that this is what we expect the ownership to be. Uh, and it's also something that constantly changes based on news, just in the same way that projections change, where if we find out that Anthony Davis is playing later, that's going to impact the ownership projections on a lot of Lakers players, as well as what the actual projections are, because there's a correlation there. Uh, but it's it's an algorithm. I don't really, I think that answers this question, but I'm not totally sure. But also in terms of how I get it, I just go off the numbers we have on our site. Yep. I go off the numbers on the site. And then also just having played DFS every single day for however many months in a row, you get a feel for where the rest of the field is going to go. And a lot of it does depend on what you think the public's going to do, what you think 150 maxers are going to do. And you just kind of have a, I wouldn't say it's a gut feel, but you just kind of know when you look and you see 20% for us Westbrook, I can guarantee you that's double. Like he will be at least double that number on DraftKings tonight. He will be 40% plus. And that's just from knowing how DFS works, knowing how a projection system is going to work. And it's just a foregone conclusion that the algorithm, it is incredible. They are so, so smart at putting that together. But also for NFL, especially, you basically start with a large target and you just narrow it down as the week goes on based on other factors. So I I can tell you right now that you will not find a better ownership projection site than Osimo. It's still so inherently hard to do because it's very difficult to react to late news and NBA and be able to come up with the exact number, but it is incredible how many times it's capable of doing that. Yeah. And then once again, it's in general, I'm just going to go off of, Hey, what are the numbers we have on the site? And then also I like to look at the boom bus tool and being like, Oh, what happened now? But anyway, the, I'll, I'll look at the boom bus tool to get a sense of who we think should be over under on, but uh, go, go, what, what are the updates we have here for me? Oh, Tony just said they basically give Eric LSD and he figures out the ownership. (laughs) It's like, I just imagine uh, what's that movie, uh, the minority report. You know what I'm talking about with uh, Tom Cruise? I'm like one of the people that gets plugged, the three people that live out in the wilderness and then they put the little things in their head and they tell the future. That's me. It, it actually, so Eric has a twin brother and I mean, not Eric, uh, Alex Baker is a twin brother and it's yes. just Alex Baker with the Mark Davis haircut. And he just intuitively knows what all the ownership is. And we just ask him and he just uploads it onto the site. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. That would be really, really great. What is great though, I will say going back to real things is prize picks, daily prop based contests at prize picks. We're going to talk about them for the half hour afterwards, but if you haven't had a chance to go over there and play yet, Promo code Osmo gets you $100 first match deposit bonus right now. No sharks, optimizers, or mass entries. You get five players. You, or you basically get to pick up to five props. So between two and five props that are on the board. They have sports like PGA. Uh, we have live before lock for PGA starting up at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, me and Ben Ross are going to be breaking down the entire Bermuda golf tournament that may or may not happen because uh, rain is a thing. Wind is a thing, but we will break that down. You have all of the great college football stuff that we have from Makajewski and Ben Rasa as well. Soccer props. They have cricket props. They'll have women's European basketball. They'll have CSGO. They have every single sport. So if there's something that you're into that you want, that you know that you, you have down something that you have a projection system for, whether you're using tools here at Osmo or yourself, Get in to prize picks right now and take advantage of that knowledge in multiple sports. Cross-sport entries are allowed, so uh, go to the App Store, download it, Google Play as well. 
or head to prizepicks.com and sign up using promo code Osmo for that $100 first match deposit bonus. Greg, is there anything in the props tool or something that you found in your research today that you feel like is a great play for prize picks? Uh, for prize picks, uh, I don't have access to the site where I live. So I don't know what the exact numbers are, but I could just look in general at some of the uh, props that we have on our site and compare them in terms of what we have in our player prop pool, uh, player prop tool and compare them. Is there any individual player prop that you really liked on prize picks? And then I could compare that to some of the data we have on the site and then my projections as well. All right. Well, I was looking actually at some oh, NFL Anthony stuff. Davis is play- Anthony Davis is playing, by the way. So that change. seems important. So if you're on yeah. prize picks right now, I would be, well, what is Russell Westbrook's rebound prop? What do we have him in for? Uh, That's an important thing to know. Um, doesn't look like he is listed here as I'm going down the, yeah. So, I mean, I, I would assume that they didn't have anything listed because it was so, so dependent. You have a guy like Anthony Davis who may or may not be available there. That's just, uh, a well, very Anthony, Davis is, Anthony Davis is playing. I know you did. So I'm saying that I was looking oh, okay. for Russell Westbrook. Um, I was going to look at, see if he had a, a rebounding prop that was listed for him. Uh, see if we could take an under on something like that. See if it was nerfed a little bit. Uh, with the intent that Anthony Davis was not going to play, but so many things that you can react to the late news and take advantage of something. If, if a player ends up uh, being ruled out and, and you're able to get in on the other side of it, uh, there are some ways to take advantage of late news, even in the props market, even on prize picks, they have something listed for everybody. Take advantage of that. Now I found something interesting, five and a half free throws made for James Harden. The guy hasn't been attempting that many free throws here so far this season. I would assume he's going to start seeing some positive regression in store for that number, but you have a free throws made prop for him. We've talked about how this foul rule, he basically is being the guy who's, who's being picked against, but he hasn't attempted more than four, three free throws in a game through four games. I think five and a half made is a large number. Not that, you know, if he gets the line six times, there's a pretty good chance he's making all six, but I love that prop today, so I'm going to be playing on the under of that, and we'll talk more about that in the 30 minutes after, but let's get the reaction to Anthony Davis. I know that we'll be able to start throwing him into more lineups. I'm, I'm glad that I already still had him in the projections for things. I talked about how I was getting to 15%. I have a feeling I'm going to get to a lot more of 15% uh, Anthony Davis, especially because that news is breaking 19 minutes before lock. People don't necessarily always change their lineups uh, post-lock. Uh, like they should for sure. Late swap, such a big part of NBA, but what are you going to be doing to account for this news? Play Anthony Davis, play less of uh, awesome. Play, Glad I'm on Anthony this show Davis, with you. Thank play, you for play, all your help. Play Jesus less Christ. Of Westbrook and play less of the value plays from, from the Lakers. I guess the only <sighs> question here about Anthony Davis, do you have any concerns about his knee from yesterday? If that's something no. that could potentially limit him a couple minutes? No, I think he banged knees and he got really dramatic. And then, He's going to play a full allotment of minutes tonight. He's a drama queen. This is, there's, you're not going to put Anthony Davis out there against the freaking Oklahoma City Thunder unless you are positive that he's okay. Like, I don't see him being limited. I don't see this being an issue. I think that it was a nothingness. Like, I, I'm just giving him a full allotment of minutes. I have no concerns. It is a back to back. If there was any concerns I did have, it would maybe be a muted minute or two here or there. We had him in for 34 minutes in our site. I have him in for 35 and a half here at the moment. Uh, coming off of 42 minutes, obviously, that's a season high in an overtime game last night where he performed really, really well. I mean, he's still going to play probably 36, 37 minutes in regulation if this game stays close. Maybe it has less of a chance of staying close with the event that they're both in there, but Vegas doesn't reflect it being double digits. So I'm more than happy to just be firing up Anthony Davis tonight. And then one other question. Do you think you are going to play more of Anthony Davis or Russell Westbrook? Because I'm waiting on this ownership update here. Mm-hmm. Uh, if there's, if people are going to be, we, we haven't had an ownership update since the Anthony Davis news, but if Russell Westbrook ends up being far more popular than Anthony Davis, I'm going to want to play more than more of Anthony Davis than Russell Westbrook. That's exactly it. But I'm, I mean, for me, it also depends on the site. I mean, Russell Westbrook's 8,400 on FanDuel. I don't know how to get away from that in any single lineup still. Um, I think on DraftKings might be where I hit the eject button, 9,300. We can get to Trey Young, I think, is an interesting tournament pivot. Not my favorite, but the ownership shouldn't be there. Um, LaMelo Ball, 8,100 is like our boy. 
Uh, I don't know what those minutes are going to look like going forward, considering Ish Smith is definitely a good backup. And that's something we've talked about multiple times on shows, but uh, LaMelo ball is still LaMelo ball 8,100. He can get over top of that price tag. I think there's a number of pivots that I like uh, over on that side, as opposed to FanDuel where there's like nobody who remotely projects better for me than Russell Westbrook at $8,400 point per dollar for anybody above, you know, even 5k on the entire site. Yeah, no, I think it, I, I agree. It's, it is really hard to get away from Russell Westbrook unless we find out on this ownership projection that Russell Westbrook is like 50% owned and Anthony Davis is like 5% or something. I, I, I really don't know what to expect from Anthony Davis's ownership, especially when you consider the slate locks in 16 minutes. I was assuming he was out and I assume that many people were assuming that he was out as well. Yep, I think so. Stop this AD love. <laughs> I can't help it. He's going to be way underutilized, even if I'm wrong. Like, here's the thing is even if I'm wrong about Anthony Davis, you're getting Anthony Davis without LeBron James on the floor at sub 25%, almost guaranteed. Like I can't imagine in the $4 on DraftKings that Anthony Davis is going to get over 25% on a 10 game slate where this news broke late. I can't imagine that Russell Westbrook is going to be under or that he's going to be under 40%. Like you're, you're just looking at such a disparity between the two and Anthony Davis is at 9,700 Russell Westbrook's at 9,300. I mean, it just, for me, becomes such a good play. And that's why I was talking about DraftKings specifically where, you know, I could see myself not getting to all the Russell Westbrook because I want to get to that payup option of Anthony Davis. This news broke late enough still. I mean, that game doesn't start for another hour and 15 minutes. So maybe I'm over-exaggerating a little bit. Um, I've been known to do such things, but I, I think that I absolutely love Anthony Davis. He's probably my favorite tournament play on the entire slate now today. So now here's a, here's something else that I'm kind of uh, wrestling with because people are asking, I'm seeing it come up in the chat. People are saying, do you still play Russell Westbrook? Yes, yes, 100%. You're playing lots of Westbrook in cash. First player you're putting into a cash lineup and then uh, from, from there you figure everything else out. Still, you have to play Russell Westbrook in cash on FanDuel and DraftKings. Anthony Davis, though, would you rather play Anthony Davis or Giannis in a cash game? Or are you trying to fit Westbrook, Giannis, and Davis in? Because that could be a little bit of a pricing issue. I didn't build a cash lineup, so it's probably tough to talk about. But I, I have a feeling that on FanDuel, it's pretty easy to play Giannis, Russell Westbrook. I, I don't know if Anthony Davis at 10-5 over there is going to be like somebody that you have to get to. As I'm plugging them in, as we're kind of like talking through this as an, as an exercise here for myself, Plugging that in, I mean, it would come really down to projections for me too, which I know sounds like a cop-out answer, but it's true. They're just the best projections. And you still have $4,000 plus to be able to spend after you plug in Russell Westbrook, Anthony Davis, Giannis, and Tedekumpo. You're going to play still. I mean, you don't have LeBron James out there and you lost a lot of money on uh, Malik Monk dropped down to 3,700 over on DK. You play Baysmore. I think you're probably going to have four Lakers in cash more than likely. Um, and I, I think it's pretty easy to still kind of round out that lineup. I'd probably be inclined to just play two of the three, but again, I'm, I'm saying that just without playing cash. So I don't want to say that that's a foregone conclusion, but um, Anthony Davis is going to be underutilized specifically for tournaments, which is what you and I are focused on. And um, I, I think that that just makes him such an easy plug and play now. Yeah, I think uh, if if possible, um, I think you should try to play all three. And I think that is viable on this slate. And I just wouldn't even care. Like, there's, it's a big enough slate with enough value options. Like you mentioned, Malik Monk being one who I think makes for the most obvious value play. There's a handful of guys, sub 4K, that I think we could get into our lineups that would make all three of them viable for cash games together. Uh, Joseph C, should you stack them in tournaments? Like, would you stack the Lakers game? I mean, for me, I'm going to have a rule maximum of four Lakers. I mean, that's just kind of the standard rule on FanDuel. You can't roster more than four. So there you go. But I bet most of my lineups are going to have some kind of rotation of three of them. Um, you know, in, in whatever capacity that's going to be, it's going to be primarily Russell Westbrook, Anthony Davis, and, uh, Malik Monk on DraftKings, I would assume, but, uh, Davion Mitchell, kind of a piece that I'm pivoting to a little bit, somebody that point per dollar sticks out a lot in our projections. And, um, so, I mean, that's going to be another piece that rotates into, it allows me to get up to some Giannis in some of these lineups. But, uh, I, I think, uh, would you, would you have any problem playing four Lakers today in a lineup on, uh, for tournaments? Not at all. I think you want to run it back with SGA or maybe mm -hmm. Lou Dort or somebody else on the Thunder side, because I think you're starting to get into a situation where it's like, okay, what needs to happen for four Lakers on draft on FanDuel, maybe five Lakers on DraftKings, some sort of situation like that for them to go off, which by the way, that was the winning lineup last night was there was a game stack of, of Spurs Lakers. 
Part of it was because that game went to overtime. But even if that game didn't go to overtime, that was still going to be the winning lineups last night. So I think that it is something that is fine to do, but make sure you have Thunder players in that lineup as well. Assuming we're talking about tournament options and not cash games. Cash games, no issue, because that's just where a lot of the good value is. Right. Okay. Well, we've got 12 minutes here up until lock. Do you want to run the Hall of Fame segment here quick, Jordan? Can we do that now uh, so that we can give Greg a second? He can tweak everything. Take a look as the ownership gets updated for everybody. We have some massive, and I mean massive, screenshots that have been popping up here across the awesomeo.com sphere in every single sport, NHL, NFL, NBA. And it's crazy because Jock, uh, Jordan Lockhart has produced two of them. Uh, Jock, I almost said like Jock Market on the thing. I don't even know. But Jordan Lockhart, Not this again. what a stud. Yeah, you know what? I'm just talking fast. I just get going. I'm so excitable. Uh, we're... <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Now I'm just going to talk slower. Here we go. Jordan Lockhart. Can't believe this actually happened. Uh, dude, it did happen. Congratulations. 138K on the Sunday night football slate. What a screenshot. Doesn't get a whole lot better than that, my guy. And he had just had a baby girl October 1st. Uh, those diapers just got upgraded, sir, because then you hit up 70K in NBA last night. He said, y'all are incredible. Literally cannot thank you all enough. Join the best team in DFS. I would agree with that sentiment. Uh, congratulations. Absolute smash. He's somebody that's been putting in the work. Great to see it kind of come to fruition. Over 200K in three days. Ridiculous. We've got a guy here, Zach Landner as well. Uh, he ended up playing in, uh, I believe it's, yeah, the 25 cent over on, on Yahoo. We, we encourage everybody, any event that you're able to get to, obviously it has to have 5Ks or more in order to be eligible for that free month of awesome plus platinum but that's still awesome to see 25 cents into 53 dollars that's a 200 times x uh that's a gigantic gigantic roi so congratulations to you sir and then brandon j baker 1250 and a five dollar single entry that's the kind of stuff you can do with the tools here at Osmo. That's the analysis that's Greg that's Greg's giving. I mean, I can't tell you guys enough how fun it is to see these screenshots, to see you guys succeeding in the Osmo.com community. And then Daddy Dak 95. Uh, God forbid he was actually born in 1995. That makes me feel old. But congratulations to you, sir. Carson Wentz up in the MVP it was a sharp play, even in that win. So well done for you as well. And I think we have one more screenshot here coming down the line. Adam, uh, Bailerigian, I apologize. I absolutely murdered, uh, just absolutely murdered that. But the stack correction devil got me good last night. Yep, that'll tend to happen. But that's still a massive ROI. Congratulations to you guys. Download the Osmo profile, pick at Osmo.com slash avatar. Tweet over to our Osmo Hall of Fame segment over on Twitter and get that free month of Osmo plus platinum. Finish in the top three. Don't have it split three ways and you will get that free month. All right, Greg Ehrenberg, nine minutes to go. What do you got for me? What are you starting to see in your lineups? Yeah. Uh, so also, do we have an ownership update? Because I did just run a version of my lineups. And we have an ownership update from one minute ago. We could see that. all of the uh, most recent ownership. And Anthony Davis right now is currently projected for 14% ownership on, on draft. Uh, that's a number I think to be way overweight to. And only 15% on FanDuel. So we're seeing Russell Westbrook still way more popular than Anthony Davis. We have 47% ownership on FanDuel going to Russell Westbrook. So that is, uh, you know, we're looking at more than 3x the ownership on Russell Westbrook compared to Anthony Davis. On DK, where we still have the ownership on Russell Westbrook, relatively low at 21% projected right now, still more popular play than Anthony Davis. So I think that if you're going to make lineups that don't include Russell Westbrook, you include Anthony Davis in them. I think that is a really sensible way to build some tournament lineups today. Anthony Davis now is uh, become my favorite tournament play of the day. I agree with that. He's by far my favorite. Oh my God. If <laughs> Could you just imagine he goes out there and, and just like looks hobbled? I, I can't even with myself right now, but I'm going to have all the Anthony Davis in the world. It makes way too much sense. Uh, way too much sense. Has this affected at all? How much Kent Bazemore and Malik Monk you're getting to? And how do you still feel about Rajon Rondo considering he's at 3,500? How does this affect the rest of the Lakers for you? I mean, they're, they're way less appealing looking value plays. I hardly have any Kent Bazemore. I have exposure to Malik Monk, but I'm a little bit underweight to the field on him. And guys like DeAndre Jordan and Dwight Howard, I was getting to before, just not as much now because Anthony Davis, if I had him out of my projections before, that's a massive difference. <laughs> the outlook of the Lakers in terms of usage and playing time that's available. So it's Malik Monk still is the best value play. And then Russell Westbrook and Anthony Davis, both great spend up options, but 
ancillary pieces of the Lakers, just not something I'm really getting to. All righty. Uh, we just got a super chat from Soul Dope. One, two, three, four. He's good people. He's hanging out in the chat all the time. He said, FD. All right, get ready. 3v3. You ready to go? Uh, let's see. I'm going to scroll up to find. Here it is. Yep, I've got it. There you go. Now. So Dame Achua Plumley versus Bay's 80 Zubats. So I don't I don't really like Zubats or Bays more for this slate. Uh, obviously, I love Anthony Davis, but it's the uh, Dame Achua Plumley combination just because it's hard to feel good about Kent Bay's more minutes when the game went to overtime last night and he just wasn't the guy who was getting the minutes for them than with Malik Monk to close the game. So with that in mind, I'm going to side with the uh, Dame, Machu, and Lonely combo. All right, everybody. Hey, hit that like button for us as well. We've got 3,000 people hanging out in the chat talking NBA on a Wednesday evening. Doesn't get a whole lot better than this. I would. There's nowhere I would rather be, that's for sure. This is fantastic. Uh, looking forward to it. we got Barnes or Bridges on DK. I'm assuming that's Miles Bridges. Oh, my, Miles Bridges. Well, actually, you know, both these guys have been ridiculously good to start the season. Uh, certainly a leap forward for Miles Bridges. I think we knew he had potential for, but not something we really could have expected uh, to this extent. He's been one of the best young players in the league. And arguably, Kukul, okay, LaMelo Ball, and Miles Bridges is the most exciting young combination of players in, in all of the NBA. Uh, Harrison Barnes, also, he's had a ridiculously good start to the season. But we have such a long track record on Harrison Barnes of not being this player that I tend to think it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors. He's going to regress. This could be who Miles Bridges is going forward, so he's my preferred option there. I love that call. That's my call as well, and I mean, I'm biased towards Harrison Barnes. I love that man, but definitely going to be Miles Bridges for me as well. All right, everybody, get those lineups in. It is very, very important. We've got five minutes to go. I'm doing the same here. I'm just kind of re-crunching a bunch of things. How much Anthony Davis are you getting to on this slate? I mean, we're talking about him repeatedly, but it just bears repeating. Uh, a little over 40% for me right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm capping him at 50 here. I think that that's the quick fix for me because otherwise I'm, I just project him for a little over 50 and he's just breaking everything that I had before, which is okay. I mean, I just want to get to him in bulk here and that makes the most sense to me. Yeah, Russell Westbrook, I'm not getting to as much of him on DK. I'm still getting to quite a bit, so don't get me wrong, but uh, not necessarily as... Uh, just because I have to spend money on Anthony Davis. Now I have to get to more of him and um, just going to get to more of him. I'm going to get to hundred percent of Russell Westbrook. I think on FanDuel, probably the way that that's going to break down uh, any questions here, Al Horford, that is a guy that I've seen uh, brought up a number of times here today. Uh, I guess you're only playing over on FanDuel. What's his tag over there? Uh, so Al Horford on FanDuel is 6,600. He's in my player pool, but not like, not some substantial number. I have 6% of them in the lineup build I did right now. So he's somebody worth having some exposure to in GPPs. He has almost no ownership today for playing a bunch of lineups. He looked, he's looked really good when he's been on the court this year, but it is a little hard to know exactly what to make them given the limited amount of time he's actually been on the court. But yeah, I, I think if you're playing a bunch of lineups, small percentage, if you're just, if you're playing like one or three, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider them that. And again, everybody, there's only one game that's locking here at seven o'clock Eastern time, which means we're going to be coming back with another half hour uh, directly after this for prize picks. Looking forward to that. And we'll be able to do some analysis. I guess there's only the one game going on. Probably won't be tracking that one as much, but we can definitely talk uh, in the event that we need to pivot to some stuff, uh, pivot off of uh, some plays that nest might you know, not be doing so well there. So we'll still be talking some of the DraftKings and FanDuel stuff as that's going on. So don't go anywhere. Three minutes here to go before lock. Uh, I see in the chat, Trey, A.D. Ayton, or Russ Giannis Adams. If you're going to give 3v3s, please, please, please give us a site. you got to put a site next to it because otherwise it is impossible to try to figure out exactly what we're going to do with that for you. Um, let's see. Yay, free half hour. Yeah, that's as good as it gets. Uh, awesome, yo. Mike Lawrence, a new guy doing some producing for us. I really enjoy his company, Good People. Uh, give him a shout out. Give him some love on some of the shows he's doing, including the PGA Live Before Lock I'll be on tonight. Uh, we got Trent Jr. or Grayson Allen on DK. I didn't even think about Grayson Allen once today. Uh, yeah, that would be Gary Trent Jr. for me. Neither one of them are guys who I'm dying to roster, but Gary Trent Jr., if, if it has to be one or the other. It must be one or the other. You have no other choice. Um, no other choice. Oh, we can rebuild his entire lineup uh, 90 seconds before lock. <laughs> I love telling people that. It's like, yeah, you got 90 seconds. Uh, best of luck putting your $500 cash lineup uh, completely upside down. Best of luck to you, sir. Uh, is Drogic in play? Uh, I do not think you need to be even be contemplating Drogic whatsoever on a 10-game slate today. 
No, he's been, you know, coming into the year, I thought there was sneaky potential for him to be fantasy relevant just because there's a lot of usage up for grab in front. Also, there's no Pascal Siakam for them right now. But minutes per game in the last three, now he's coming off the bench 12 minutes, 14 minutes, 14 minutes. It, just the playing time isn't there. Agreed. Um, how much J Val did you get to at the center position today? Because I know center is going to be kind of taken up quite a bit by one uh, by one Anthony Davis, especially over on Fandle, where you're able to get all that dual position eligibility. Anything that's really sticking out to you at center here for the last minute? No, I think Anthony Davis is overall a top tier guy. The next two guys take a look at are Mo Bamba and Jonas Valanciunas, but they're both going to be really popular. There is a lower owned pivot play I like in Wendell Carter Jr., uh, just because there is so much ownership going to Mo Bamba, and for a good reason, considering what his uh, price tag is, 6,300, and how good of a points from a fantasy producer he is. He projects to be a really good points per dollar play, but we've seen Mo Bamba get in foul trouble a lot over the course of his career, and I think that should that happen, uh, there's a chance that Wendell Carter Jr. ends up playing over 30 minutes, and he's also somebody who's a pretty good points per fantasy producer. So as a lower-owned pivot play, Wendell Carter Jr. is only projected for 8% ownership today. That's a pivot that I also like. So I'm overweight to the field on Wendell Carter, number one, because I think he's a good play, but then number two also, uh, a, little bit of, a little bit of leverage off of uh, Mo Bamba is currently projected to be the second most popular play on FanDuel. I'm not forgetting about Discord. We've got uh, Discord. We've got FanDuel GPP, Plumley SGA Hayward, or Bruce Brown, Yana Zubats for an FD GPP. Uh, oh, by the way, also Norman Powell is out today. He will. Not oh, okay. Fine. That actually um, matters a little, but we'll, we'll see what that Portland rotation ends up being. You should have a ton of spots to be able to pivot. Um, I wasn't added in that question. So what was uh, what, I'm scrolling up to find it? Can you, how about this me? one from Mr. Moneybags? We got dumpster diving Rondo or JaVale DK GPP. Neither of them have locked yet. Uh, the answer is neither now that we have Anthony Davison, but Rondo, if you absolutely have to pick one. Yep, if you have to pick one. Uh, Davis, Westbrook, or Giannis, two of the three in DK Cash. Uh, Davis, Westbrook, Giannis. I mean, that was kind of the question of the day. We addressed that a little bit here for you. Hopefully that helped. Um, but yeah, Cole Anthony Day for somebody. I, I don't mind Cole Anthony on the slate. How about you? Um, I have exposure to him, but I'm a little bit underweight to the field. I'm pretty sure most recent run of ownership, we have him at 17%. I'm um, yeah, very slightly underweight to that. It's just the price tag's gone up on him. And there's still a lot of guards in that rotation. You know, there's, there's still, he's going to be competing for minutes and touches with Jalen Suggs. Jalen Suggs has been massively inefficient this year, but that's still something that going forward, I think has to be at least a little bit better than what it's been. And then Terrence Ross off the bench, RJ Hampton, Gary Harris wasn't active earlier in the season. So he's a viable play, but he's, he's fairly popular in my opinion, relative to his price tag. All tail looks good to me. That lineup looks good to me in discord. Dwight Howard, 3,500. I thought he was going to be the savior of my lineups last night. Uh, it's somebody that I got to underneath 1%, just a high fantasy point per minute guy and thought he could get some minutes. What's up? What's up? Oh, prize picks time. Yeah, it is prize picks time. I was just kind of addressing some of the premium Discord stuff, rounding it out, but it is prize picks time, of course. Best of luck to everybody here today. We'll kind of constantly be checking in here on that Charlotte game for sure. Uh, again, only one game locked, so we still have some ability to, to answer some questions about whatever else, but we are going to talk prize picks because it is such a great place to be playing at right now. As I said before, you have daily prop-based contests. You pick two to five players, you're going to have different payout structures depending on how many you have there, but you can up to 10x your buy-in. They have promotional stuff going on all the time too, where they're basically giving you a freebie. I know they had a Patrick Mahomes one. They had a Tom Brady one earlier. Take advantage of some of those promotions because those kind of things can be just as good as the picks themselves. But of course, we're going to be focused on the picks here too. And we have so many tools here at Osmo between the prop. Uh, we have the, the prop tool for NFL, for NBA, for everything else that you could possibly want that can help you. Uh, be able to identify the best plays on the board here constantly. There's no sharks, optimizers, mass entries. You're not playing head to head against anybody else. You're simply playing against prize picks. And if you have all these other sports that I brought up here earlier on prize picks, we've got MMA. We've got, uh, I know that that's Greg streets. He's so, so good at the MMA product stuff here at Osmo NHL. Jake Harry and the boys can help you out there. PGA Ben Rasa, Jason Ross and myself. Uh, we have shows, we have content, we have things that you can use to make money on prize picks. 
starting right now. So go download it at the App Store. But let's start going through some of these NBA props here for today. I had brought up James Harden, five and a half free throws made. That one just looked really, really high to me. We are going to see some regression with players not being able to lean in and just create uh, free throw attempts. And James Harden definitely, I think, has been a little bit ostracized uh, because he's the main culprit of that in years past. And five and a half uh, free throws made just seems a little bit high for him there. But anything that stick out to you at first glance over at prize picks today? Uh, well, we can talk about the Nets situation, how some of these guys are going to be impacted because we just found out that Bruce Brown is going to be starting for the Nets. Uh, so okay. that starting lineup is officially uh, James Harden, Joe Harris, Kevin Durant, Bruce Brown, and Blake Griffin. So first off, I'm kind of curious to see which, obviously Kevin Durant and James Harden are going to have pri- are going to have props over at prize picks. But do any of the other Nets guys, I'm just doing some rolling to see if I could find any other Brooklyn players. It'd probably be easier to search in Miami because they're playing Miami. Let's see who comes up. Um, do you see, do you see any, any props for anybody on the next outside of Harden and Durant? Outside of Harden and Durant, I think they're going to be the only ones listed. So a lot of the time they'll have only kind of the most popular plays on the slate that are going to be listed for it. So sometimes in sports books, you're going to be looking at, you know, shorting somebody on one and a half, uh, passing yards or, or sorry, one and a half uh, receiving yards or something like that. Somebody might see one snap or two snaps. Most found, of the I, time at prize. I found, Go ahead. I, I found they, they have okay. Blake Griffin. They have Joe Harris here. Um, so I actually like um, Joe Harris props now. And okay. he's somebody who we have projected on our site to be, uh, we haven't scoring 12.8 uh, points for today. And I'm actually a little bit above that, especially now that we don't have the Nets' ability to play quite as many big lines with Nick Claxton out. So I think that Joe Harris, over 11.5 points for him, I think that is something that that makes sense. The matchup against Miami isn't quite ideal, but the Heat have been playing at a faster pace this year with Kyle Lowry, a point guard. Uh, and I like the potential for minutes, so over 30 minutes in three or four games for Joe Harris. And that, that should be solidified with no Nick Claxton, even if it's not – somebody who generally would think more minutes for Joe Harris because Nick Claxton's out. It's just more small ball for the Nets. I love that. We got a super chat here from Taylor, me, LD. Any thoughts on Aaron, on Aaron Holiday with Neto out today? Uh, not somebody I rostered at all. Did you roster I have 0% would be my thoughts about that. So, uh, yeah, I, I just can't imagine that I would, I would make that play today. Um, different slate, different time, not this one. Uh, but let's see uh, what else we have here. So looking over here, yeah, I like the Joe Harris. I, I think that that's actually not a bad play here at all. Uh, he's going to see the ball go in the bucket here as well. Same thing with James Harden. I expect that point out that point output to kind of regress back to the mean. 20 and a half seems even a little low for him, but you can't parlay the same player together in the same prop. So I can't have his points uh, taking the over there and less than free throws made. So you're basically picking one of the two here in these spots. Um, but I'm telling you, this NBA product, I mean, how clean does this site look? It's it's super easy to navigate, super easy to be able to combine some of the plays. And I will say, this is something that Lafayette brought up, and I just think it's very, very fascinating. If you only have, if you have these two plays, and generally on a parlay, uh, like at a sports book, you got to hit both in order to get your money and in order to get paid. And if you don't hit both, you lose. Well, even on 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 like if something where you get one out of the two here, you're getting half of your money back. That's a really, really good deal in the event that it's something you're trying to take advantage of and it just doesn't work out. Somebody gets hurt. It's a little bit of an insurance policy that you're getting on your props. So I think that that's really a fascinating deal as well. They even give you back, I believe it's 0.4x when you put five players together uh, and you get three of five. So if you get three of five, if you're if you end up being somebody who falls too short of that, it's still going to give you some of your money back. And that's just something that will long-term help you sustain a little bit of that bankroll if you're going for some big shots. But uh, what else is starting to pop out to you on the board right now? Uh, So let's look at some of the uh, Lakers props. Because, you know, I know that some people in the chat are like, why are you guys talking about the Lakers so much? Because Anthony Davis was questionable and LeBron James for that. (laughs) It becomes becomes pertinent to the... uh, to the DFS slate. Uh, so we, we don't have, uh, oh, there actually are, there wasn't earlier when I looked props for uh, some of the other Lakers guys, but I guess now that we have the official Anthony Davis news, there is 
Malik Monk, we have at 17 points over on, uh, on, on prize picks. We've got Kent Bazemore at nine and a half points. Uh, I'm inclined to go with the under on Kent Bazemore, just given what we saw his role look like yesterday. It was a spot that you and I both really like Kent Bazemore a lot. He was in your best lineup yesterday. He was in my best lineup yesterday and ended up being a little bit disappointed. He ended up playing 31 minutes. But it was a game that went to overtime, and there should have been potential for him to get more than that kind of playing time. And just the usage wasn't there for him. Overall, his numbers this year, he's been a starter for the entire season for the Lakers. Points scored 8, 4, 11, 5. So he hasn't been prolific on offense. The usage hasn't been there. And I don't think it's going to be there today, even with LeBron out. So under 9.5 points, I like for Kent days more. That's a really, really good call. I'm looking also, so Ken, we have three pointers made. You have a number of opportunities for this. Jimmy Butler. 0.5 three pointers made. Um, I'm just kind of pulling up some of the numbers here for Jimmy Butler. Uh, it's taking a second for me to load. Got a lot of tabs going here at the moment, but Jimmy Butler so far on the season has attempted three pointers all in one game. Uh, so we went one for three against Indiana. Otherwise, 15 for 21, all inside the lane, six for 10 and game one, uh, all inside the lane. 0.5 seems so, so low. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I like less than somebody that hasn't necessarily been, been attempting a bunch of threes in years past here as well. I think that that's something that kind of sticks out to me. It might seem strange to be going that direction, but he goes through these phases where he just takes it to the rack repeatedly. A lot of mid-range jumpers. Um, that's kind of his role in this offense. And now you get Kyle Lowry out there on the perimeter, going to be handling a lot of the ball. Jimmy Butler getting it uh, either at the, at the free throw line, uh, you know, at the block. He does a lot of creating for this team. Jimmy Butler is just a phenomenal basketball player, but I like the less than 0.5 three-pointers there. How about yourself? So here's what I'm looking through Jimmy Butler's game logs from this year and last year. When do you think he made his first three pointer last year? I mean, game five, based on the way you said that. Uh, February 9th, he did not make what? a three pointer until February. part of it was because he missed. Also, the season started late, but yeah, even, it, still, it still started in December around Christmas, mm -hmm. and he missed he missed a couple of weeks. But yeah, so that was still like his game of the season or something like that but yeah he didn't hit a he didn't hit a three-pointer until february last year <laughs> he's not a guy that takes a whole bunch of three-pointers typically unless it's something that's absolutely needed of him and to your point he's made one three-pointer so far this year and didn't attempt three-pointers in the other two games so is it possibly it's a three-pointer of course is it the most likely scenario actually i'm gonna agree with you and think he's more likely to not make a three-pointer than he is to make a three-pointer today I love it when you're on my side with something that makes me feel extra, extra confident. I just also think it's a really fun sweat, you know, to be able to put on a game and, uh, you know, not to talk to just straight up recreational betting, but I mean, being able to sweat that or being able to sweat like the, the rushing props for a guy who has like 0.5 rushing yards, like, will he even see the field? I always think that those props are really entertaining. Uh, and then this one specifically, looking at Jimmy Butler, I just think that it backs it up where Jimmy Butler just goes through these phases, I'm telling you, where he just doesn't attempt threes. It looks like a really, really great prop to kind of take advantage of. Um, anything in some of these later games? Let's say we start getting to, you know, the the evening and you're kind of looking to get some action either on De'Aaron Fox, uh, Devin Booker, if you're going to be watching that game in the late nine hammer. You have, uh, we have Portland and Memphis. That game's going to be moving up and down the floor. We just got word that uh, Norman and Powell's going to be out if we can kind of react to anything from that because uh, it doesn't look like it's updated here on prize picks a guy like Robert Covington who has seven and a half points for his prop that'd be fascinating if you get him in the starting lineup here and that becomes kind of an instant play for me but talk to me a little bit about something maybe in the late night hammer that looks uh, like it sticks out to you yeah, so uh, let me look at Portland today. So we have no Norman Powell in the lineup. My assumption is that Nasir Little is going to start. Nasir Little has been starting for them in games uh, without Norman Powell. Let's see, there is no props here for Nasir Little. Um, gaming load, what can we find here for Dame? So Dame's most recent props, it's the fantasy score for Damian Lillard. 47, the 47 and a half number looks pretty high on Damian Lillard, in my opinion. Uh, did you, did you, play, did you play much Damian Lillard for DFS today? I did on FanDuel. Um, FanDuel, that price tag is broken. Uh, it, it's just way too low at 8,200. I'll be the fish who goes and chases that. I'm just fine with it. He's off to like a prolifically bad start from the three point line. Uh, I saw the number. It was, uh, what was he? Two for 24 or something to start off the season. 
let's expect some positive. What was the number? Did you, two for 28? He's shooting 8%. Also, hey, yeah, so I got that right. Two for 24. Wait. Why I thought you were interrupting Jordan, me for something that mattered. Also, also, why did Jordan interrupt you? Then you couldn't hear, so you tried to get it, and then he started giving you fingers. Like, he's, he's like, as if you're going to be able to tell, like, no, this is how many three-pointers he missed. And he's, like, going like this, like when he's counting down shows in the background and we can't see his fingers. Also, I knew I missed. Yeah, can we get Tyler Zander eternally on every stream from now until forever? That'd be great. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sure he would love that, too. But I love Damian Lillard. Uh, on FanDuel, I don't think you need to even be screwing with it whatsoever over on DraftKings. This is why you need to be play, mul- play multiple sites. But on prize picks, 27 and a half points. I mean, that's that should kind of tell you right away. I mean, a majority of his fantasy output is going to be in those spots where he has a, a massive ceiling. I mean, what I tend to probably shade towards the under, yes. But I think that's kind of a, a stay away in general. For me, I'm looking at like the ancillary options. I mean, I see Robert Covington, seven and a half I, again, Nasir Little more than likely going to be the starter. Do you have any Nasir Little interest in DFS tonight? Uh, Nasir Little, so I only played on FanDuel, so that would make him uh, less appealing. But let's see, was he is he the flat man on DraftKings or somewhere around the flat man? Uh, 3,900, actually, I believe. Not at, not at 3,900. If he was still back at like the 32, 3,100 price, I guess, but not at that salary. Yeah, I think that that's fair. Um, let's see. All right, I'm going back to the prize picks here. I'm looking back at some of these other options. Can we go to NFL for Thursday? Is that something you're interested in looking at at all? We could look at NFL for Thursday. There's also, by the way, people aren't aware of all the stuff they have over on prize picks. Is it, let's say you have a wealth of knowledge in other sports. They don't have it up right now, but they've had disc golf. They have sports for the Olympics. They have highlight up there sometimes. Uh, there's NFL, NBA, uh, MMA, MLB for the World Series, NHL, PGA, college football, soccer, but also there's a lot of uh, obscure sports you wouldn't normally see on other uh, sites that end up on prize picks. But yeah, we could look at uh, we could look at NFL as well. All right, because I see two and a half touchdowns for Kyler Murray. I want to play Kyler Murray under two and a half to a touchdowns right now in a number of books. You can use those to kind of compare. What is going on over at Prize Picks? Which one, which ones might be advantageous? Two and a half touchdowns for Kyler Murray is going at minus two hundred five at the book that I'm looking at here right now. Uh, you know, a pretty popular book. I'm going to say less than two and a half touchdowns for Kyler Murray. There is definitely something to take advantage of. I mean, obviously, Aaron Jones is going to be relied on heavily. I think looking at his point five touchdowns and kind of combining those two and taking the over for Aaron Jones with legitimately no wide receivers and legitimately no other hope of being able to advance the ball other than him from the Green Bay Packers side. I mean, Aaron Rodgers is pretty good too, but 0.5 touchdowns for Aaron Jones. Give me the over on that. Give me less than two and a half for Kyler Murray. What do you, what say you on those two? Uh, boy, somebody must have recorded a prize picks video earlier to just been right away, just off the top of his head to pull uh, football numbers here. So I'm looking through the football numbers. On pri- Am I correct that you may have done that earlier? I may have, you know, already studied it a little bit this morning, 6 a.m. out here on the West Coast, having coffee, enjoying my morning and uh, putting together all my NFL stuff for the week because uh, Wednesday kind of kicks off my my research for NFL. We have the ownership show. And yeah, that was definitely one that I loved. And again, I love the, the ability to play all these cross-sport parlays so easily together. It's what makes prize picks so great is the ability to just not have just NBA, but also to have NFL included too. Uh, so I'm looking at Kyler Murray under 26 and a half rushing yards. Uh, just the, the way the Cardinals have run their offense this year, I think it's because they're trying to preserve the health of Kyler Murray. He's hardly ever run the ball this year. I think he's been at 10 or less rushing yards in three consecutive games. He hasn't had a rushing touchdown since the third game of the season. And it's, they haven't needed him to run the ball. If it's a spot where they're down by 14 points, something like that in the fourth quarter, I think we could see Kyler Murray run the ball more often. But pulling up his game log right now, the last three games, yes, yeah, so the last three games, Kyler Murray, one rushing yard, six rushing yards, 10 rushing yards. I don't think this is a game where he's going to have to run the football that much. We now have the Cardinals favored by seven points with all the players that are out on the Packers offense. So I think under 26 and a half rushing yards, a number that I certainly wouldn't have ever thought I'd like an under of coming into the season with Kyler Murray. He just, he just hasn't run the ball very much this year. I love that call. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to that one as well. Greg, we're going to really show off here today because you know what? We just hit up NBA. We just hit up NFL. Those are two of the sports we cover here at Osmo. What's the other main one that we cover? Uh, 
uh, hockey. <laughs> good, good job. Thank you so much for going along with the bit. Of course, we're going to the World Series. If you guys want to put together a parlay that starts with the World Series, moves to NBA for the late night hammer, and then finishes off a Thursday night football, we can do that with you here today. I'm looking over at prize picks. I don't really have a whole lot of interest in playing DFS sites uh, for the MLB for the World Series here right now, uh, mainly just because I, I do not like the Houston Astros. Yeah, I said it. I hope it, somebody from Houston heard me. I do not like the Houston Astros. Go Braves. But I'm looking over here at some of these props, and I see a number of things to kind of beginning and, and taking advantage of here right now. So first of all, I don't think, yeah, Jock Peterson is in the six hole today. Uh, against Urquidy here. I'm looking at the prop for him right now, a uh, 0.5 runs and RBIs. I don't know. I, I know Jack has been out of his mind here, but I think that this might be a spot to be shorting him uh, in the six hole. Somebody who obviously you can hit the solo homer and just kind of completely burn you in that regard. But hot streaks are not necessarily a thing. I think, I think we've seen a little regression. Eddie Rosario has kind of just gone completely nuts here for the Braves. But I like less than 0.5 runs and RBIs for Jock Peterson today. Is there anything that you're seeing in the MLB streets that we might be interested in? Um, looking at the pitchers now. Um, I'm going to side with under three strikeouts for Jose or Number one, he's not a guy who generates a lot of swing and misses, but then number two, also, we just haven't seen the Astros really stretch a lot of their starting pitchers work deep in the games, especially not Jose or So uh, I think our probably isn't destined to be in this game for very long. And even if he is, I don't think he's going to be striking out a whole lot of Braves. So it's, it's a low number, but under three strikeouts for Jose or God, I love that call too. Man, see, look at this. We didn't talk about this at all before the show. I knew you'd be bringing the fire for it. So that's part of the fun of playing at Prize Picks. I wanted to explore that a little bit here on a show where we go from NBA to NFL to MLB. You can jump into the NHL streets as well. Generally going to be very consolidated as far as the options go for that. You know, 0.5, uh, you know, if you want to look at one that I really like, William Carlson, 0.5 points going up against the Stars today. The centerman for the uh, Vegas Knights, uh, somebody that I think is going to be very, very good uh, going for this Vegas Knights team. He's going to have to pick up some of the slack. I believe they just had uh, Marsha Salt go down, but I'm, I'm looking at NHL as well. I can play all these parlays together. I think it's just so much fun. PGA, I mean, I hope that they can end up getting that in. We'll be talking that all in 40 minutes here on the Awesome Network. So looking forward to that here. Um, but combining that with some NBA, it's just so much fun, super easy to do. Don't forget to use promo code AWESOMO for that $100. Uh, let's go back here to the NBA streets. Uh, what is the score of that game right now? Have we have we kind of checked in at that at all? I have not. Uh, let's see. Uh, so the game, what was the first game of the night? It is the Magic are up 16-8 on the Hornets. And... Oh, baby. We have a good set. We've got uh, Mo Bamba, Cole Anthony, and Wendell Carter Jr. all off to a big start. Four minutes, Wendell Carter Jr. six points and two rebounds. And an exact same stat line for Cole Anthony, Mo Bamba, which is uh, two points, a rebound, and assist, and a steal. So Anthony Bamba and Wendell Carter Jr. all off to uh, good fantasy starts. What is going on with LaMelo Ball? Two fouls right out of the gate again. Like, why? What is going on? You know, what's, you know, what's funny too is so people have been complaining about his minutes a lot on, on, on social media, which to an extent is warranted, but he keeps getting into early foul trouble, which limits his minutes. And then number two, there was another game also where he asked to come out of the game and asked for a snip to finish. So it's not like there's some thing where they're like, Hey, we're aggressively not trying to play a mellow ball, big minutes. It's just kind of been circumstantial. God, it's so tilting. Because I thought he was a great tournament play. I don't know what the ownership ended up on DK. I mean, I've got the $15, the $4. I have no idea what anything is. I just thought that he would end up being pretty darn low-owned in that spot, uh, but can't keep his hands to himself. So that makes it tough. Let's go back to prize picks. This is their half hour. I want to continue to go down the board on some of these props here. Uh, Jalen Suggs is out there. I guess that game already, no, that's, yeah, that game already started. So I got to refresh this because uh, that is not going to be available here any longer. Um, you do have some NBA first halves, which can be fascinating as well. If you want to try to take advantage of some of those, uh, one guy that I'm just been very, very high on. We didn't talk about him a whole lot here. He's a big play and a big question mark over at center on FanDuel. Jonas Valanciunas, and then his first half number, I'm looking at for points, eight and a half points for J-Val there. I don't know. This guy's going to be playing a lot more minutes than what he played in Memphis. You had Jaron Jackson Jr. They went small a number of times. They always limited his minutes. It looks like at least until Zion Williamson comes back, 
that Jonas is just going to be playing 35 plus minutes. It's a guy who averages well north of a fantasy point per minute. Uh, I absolutely am obsessed with him and trying to take advantage of every prop I can with him going forward. How do those two look to you? Well, here's something kind of interesting. So I was just comparing. So Jonas Valanciunas first half point total seven and a half for the game or uh, eight and a half for the game 17 and a half. So with that in mind, assuming he's going to play, you know, somewhat equal amount in the first and second half, he actually has a more favorable line for the first half than he does for the entire game. So if you're bullish on Jonas Valanciunas, which I played a bunch of Jonas Valanciunas in DFS today, the mo- everybody in the field did. So it's, it's not like S is any sort of yeah. groundbreaking information. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think that the first half line probably looks a little bit better than the entire game line. Lindquist knows he is taking on bets that have little results. What are you talking about? Are you, are, I, that's madness. That is pure madness. Uh, I'm, I'm doing pretty good myself. I'll send you a graph. How does that sound? But I'm always eating chalk because I'm the chalk donkey. Yes. No, I like Jonas Valanciunas today on FanDuel. Sorry about it. I think he's a phenomenal play. I think he's a phenomenal play on prize picks here as well. Um, but I'm looking around the board here. Uh, anything else that's sticking out to you? Let's let's make a three-play parlay here for tonight that everybody can make fun of us and roast us on Twitter for afterwards. Starting with that, James Harden. I'm starting right off the bat. Five and a half free throws made. Uh, give me, let me, let me short that one right from the get-go. That'll be my first pick. We'll let you pick the next one and then we'll kind of agree on one to finish it out. All right. I'm going to should I, get, should I go to a different sport? Absolutely. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> Jordan Klein. Oh no, I have to work. It sucks. It's so is it, hard. Is this, is this gonna, Jordan, is it gonna ruin this for you? Oh, he wants it for himself. He's selfish right. like that. All it's right. got to be well, NBA only because he's not going to go watch uh, cricket later is what he's getting at. Cool. All right. Well, I was uh, I was just looking at some other sports. I was looking at it. Also, this would be this. I don't want to tie up Jordan Klein's money because I was looking at some of the MMA, which, by the way, they also not only have the free UFC pay-per-view yes. card this week. It's weird that it's, it's weird that it's a pay-per-view, but it's also free. Uh, but they also Great. have, uh, you are absolutely picking MMA. I was going to say you have, you've now hit four sports. No, I, I mean, I, I gave the I women's Euro goods. This I, can't morning. This to, I can't do this to Jordan because then his money is tied up until Saturday. So I can't, oh, I can't, that's I can't true. That. I can't do that to him. But can you give us a pick just for fun anyway, from MMA? Yeah. So I, uh, Hamza Chemaev has a fantasy over under of 104 and a half fantasy points. And if anybody's played any kind of DFS on slates that have included Hamza Chemaev, you know, it's a little bit of a weird situation because he had an extended time off. He was thick. He had an issue with COVID and then some other issues. He briefly retired, came back. He is absolutely ridiculous for DFS scoring. So Hamza Chemaev with a fantasy point total of just 104 and a half is egregiously low when he's the guy who, you know, we've seen have no problem scoring 130 fantasy points, even higher than that in some of his wins. So. Uh, over 104 and a half for Hamza Chimaya makes a whole lot of sense, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to put that kind of evil on Jordan. How does that because fire? Then, don't put then, that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. Don't put that. Cause don't you put that knife in your leg, Ricky Bobby. Yeah. I'm <laughs> not going to make, I'm not going to make Jordan place a $5 bet. They just wait until Saturday to see, uh, to see the results of, um, let's see. Anthony Davis will only 23 points as is over under for points over on, on prize picks. No LeBron James in the lineup. Maybe a little bit of risk that we're incurring here just because he was listed as questionable play and briefly left with that knee injury yesterday. But this was a really favorable matchup against the Oklahoma City Thunder, and he should get all the usage in the world, as is. Do you know who the top fantasy scorers are so far this season? Uh, for for what? What do you mean? Just like but just drafting drafting scoring so far. This I year. mean, John Morant has to be completely blowing it away compared to what we think because, I mean, he's 9,600 now. Uh, so he is up there. Here's the top four. The top four DraftKings scoring is your number one is Kevin Durant, number two, Julius Randle, three is John Morant, four is Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis has quietly had a really good season and has not really been impacted that much by the inclusion of Russell Westbrook to this team. Number one, because LeBron James is out, but the number two also, Westbrook just hadn't been that involved in games that LeBron was healthy. So Anthony Davis's fantasy production has not been hindered at all by the inclusion of Russell Westbrook. Uh, long story short there, Anthony Davis is averaging 28 points per game this year. I like him for over 23 with, with LeBron out. God, I love that. Mo Bamba off to a massive start, 15.1 over on the FanDuel.com. 
23-14 Orlando. That's fascinating. Uh, that's going to be interesting too. Miles Bridges, good call by you, whoever asked that question. Seven points, two rebounds to start off. Uh, awfully good. Um, but yeah, you can play all the fantasy scoring stuff here over uh, at Prize Picks as well. What a what a fun spot to be able to kind of combine all of that stuff, cross between props, cross between your fantasy scores, use our projections, use our prop tools. You have everything at your disposal to be successful over at Prize Picks here. Um, so I love kind of combining all of those together. So that is going to be our play. We're going to take uh, under on uh, the three pointers made. Uh, I absolutely love that play too. Under on three pointers made for Jimmy Butler. We're going to take the under five and a half free throws made for James Harden. Jonas Valanciunas, eight and a half. Uh, we're going to take the over on his first half there. And Anthony Davis on the over as well. I want to do the flex or the power play 10 X on four picks. Oh baby. Do I love that? 20 bucks. Uh, hit that, hit that button. Jordan Klein, hit that button. You can do it. You can do it. Hit that place entry, hit the place entry, do it, do it now. I, I, I want to have the receipts. Oh, you can't fix the first half one with it. All right. So take J Val, Val off the board. We'll find one more here to kind of round it out. Uh, we've got the two there. Anthony Davis. I love the over uh, with the projected points there. So take off J Val, Greg Ehrenberg, one final one for the people on the way out. Uh, let's see now. Oh boy. Now I'm really just forcing uh, Jordan to put, to put money on this thing here. Um, oh Yeah. So Jaron Jackson Jr., I do remember comparing... Okay, so Jaron Jackson Jr., he has an over-under of 17 points on prize picks. If you go to Odd Shopper over at Osmo.com, the over-under for 17 and a half points for Jaron Jackson Jr., we have the over-hitting 70% of the time. So you can do this is 17 points instead of 17 and a half. I would be inclined to think that over 17 has a pretty high expected win rate relative to our model. So that's, that's a number that I like the over for. All right, we're going to combine that one together with it to round it all out. That is prize picks. I'm telling you, it's so fun to play. I'm looking forward to a su su successfully submitted entry. Oh, Jordan Klein, you're, you're, about to, you're about to be a rich man. Easy 10X there for you. But Greg, any final words for the people? No, good luck tonight. Also, we've got uh, potentially some late, late injury situations. Don't forget, NBA, if you guys have not played that much so far in either this year or previous years, if you're new to NBA, there are often times a lot of injuries that happen after lock. And we haven't had to worry about that too much because it's only been a few slates so far this year, but they're coming. So don't, don't set your lineups and go and leave, go out somewhere. You got to be glued to your computer when you're a, a hardcore NBA DFS player. So don't forget to be on the lookout for news. And uh, we have all that in our, uh, our premium discord channel. Winter is coming. For sure. Uh, looking forward to that. It's going to happen eventually. We're asking for it. I love late news, but also uh, Paul George happened once upon a time. Either way, that is the show. That's Prize Picks. Thank you so much to them for their sponsorship. Thank you so much to Jordan Klein behind the virtual glass, contrary to, but to what everybody thinks. I think he's one of the loveliest people ever. Can't wait to see you Friday. Uh, we going to do some fun stuff in Venice with our friends. Going to be enjoyable. Greg Ehrenberg, my absolute dude. Go have fun with your friend, in quotation marks. I don't know what that means, uh, but I saw that throughout the chat. It's awesome. Uh, we're out of here. Best of luck.